Welcome everyone to Falchevor Riv Gachdene. Welcome to this conference on the future of housing in Europe. It's my great pleasure as the head of the law school at NUI Galway to be chairing the conference today. So I'm looking forward to what I'm sure will be a very interesting day. We're very grateful to all the speakers who have given their time to be with us today. And we hope that those watching will find this a very stimulating and interesting conference program. Good morning, Dave Galair. I'm delighted to join you for this conference on the Future of Europe event, focusing on the issue of housing. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend the event and for agreeing to share your views on this important topic and how it might be best addressed and prioritised within our European Union. I want to give thanks as well to Professor Kenna and the team at the Centre for Housing, Law, Rights and Policy at the National University of Ireland, Galway, for facilitating this discussion. The Conference on the Future of Europe is an unprecedented opportunity for citizens all over Europe to make your voices heard about the future direction of our Union. We will only derive the full value from an exercise of this kind if we have a wide and inclusive range of voices taking part in a discussion that examines those issues that hold the greatest significance for Europe's citizens. Housing, and especially the challenges that Europe and Ireland's young people in particular face in obtaining a sustainable home, is arguably uh, a prime example of one such issue, undoubtedly the case here in Ireland. Housing, of course, isn't an EU competence, but it's not wrong to say that Europe can play a role in helping us to navigate issues within the broader area. Taking stock of where we are in late 2021, a serious reflection on where Europe is headed is clearly warranted in light of all that has happened in the past decade. The European Union has had to navigate several major challenges, including the financial crisis and the associated impact, of course, on the housing market in Ireland, the migration crisis, the UK's departure from the EU, and most recently, of course, the pandemic. COVID-19 required Europe to confront a once-in-a-generation public health crisis. While the past 20 months have required sacrifices of all groups in society, certain groups have had to withstand a particularly challenging time. Given that the pandemic has required us all to spend far greater levels of time in our homes than ever before, this experience has thrown into sharp relief the importance of accommodation that meets the needs of families and households. As we think about the aftermath of COVID-19 and how we can fashion a strong and equitable post-pandemic economic recovery across the Union, how best to address the social and economic needs of all following this transformative event, that must be a key question. Through the pillar of social rights, the European Union is taking the initiative to support member states to improve social protections in a number of areas, including housing, and actions to help the homeless. I would be keen to learn if participants in today's discussion believe that the Europe of the future should include, include more policies in this vein. The urgency of the climate crisis that we face has increased resonance, not least as the recent weeks uh, has seen the world's attention turned to the COP26 summit in Glasgow. It's clear, of course, that unless Europe and the world takes action today, society in the decades to come will be forced to contend with significant added challenges. The conference has a major role to play in contributing to conversations about the best EU response to climate issues at an everyday level. I'm sure many of you will have concrete suggestions about how Europe can be proactive in this area. It's essential that our transi transition to a greener future in areas like energy and housing is a just and fair one. This includes ensuring those more vulnerable groups may, who may be less well equipped to shoulder the adjustment, that they're supported and that they receive the necessary solidarity in navigating the change. EU membership has been hugely transformative for Ireland as a nation. No one can argue with that. But in much the same way, the European Economic Community that we joined in 1973 is very different from the vibrant, diverse and multicultural EU that we're part of today. As we look ahead to the 50th anniversary of Ireland joining the EU in 2023, it's timely that we reflect on the type of Europe we want to foster in the next half century and the key role Ireland will play in this process. Nevertheless, I think it's important to acknowledge that not all groups in society have shared equally in this progress and they continue to encounter obstacles in fulfilling some essential needs. Certain communities, not least our young people, can encounter particular challenges, of course, serious challenges, about housing. So it's essential that we continue to try to deliver 
the necessary strategies and supports to alleviate this. Events like today are very useful to help us consider what role the EU can play in this process and meeting needs in the years ahead. As Minister for European Affairs, I really want to hear all perspectives on the European Union, what it means for us here in Ireland and what future direction we think it should take. Today, therefore, is about you and your views. To date, I participated in the first two of the conference plenaries in Strasbourg, virtually, and I will partake in several more of these gatherings in the months ahead. The plenaries are a very good opportunity to hear how other member states, national parliaments and social partners are approaching the conference. The plenaries to come will see us examine ideas that are emerging from citizens' discussions across Europe. So events like today form part of the Irish view that feeds into future meetings of the conference plenary uh, via reporting submitted to the conference's digital platform. Indeed, I hope that your participation at today's event in NUIG might inspire you to consider organising your own Future of Europe event, big or small. One of the key advantages of the conference process is that anybody can take the initiative to do this and upload a report on their discussion to the digital platform that then forms part of the conference's larger conversation. It's important that as many people as possible have their voices heard during this process and that their opinions on the EU, positive and negative, are heard. Events such as today's seminar will form part of the Irish view that feeds into future meetings of the conference plenary via the reporting uh, that is on the digital platform. That in turn helps contribute to a consensus report which is based largely on the proceedings of the plenary and the citizens panel. This report then goes to the presence of the Council, the Parliament and the Commission for consideration of follow-up action. So I hope you realise that we all have an opportunity here now to review what the EU is doing and for it to go through the process and for those ideas, if they form part of the consensus, to end up uh, in the conclusions of this process. We know that the EU has an impact on our daily lives. There are areas where it may potentially do better. So I invite you today to share your views on how we might best achieve this. So I wish you all the best for your discussions today. Gnarig uh, Gyalliv, Leshen Di Sporok Dinyov, August Gormila Magavarish. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for those opening words, particularly for the encouragement for everybody watching to contribute to this debate and feed into the ongoing discussions within Europe on this important issue. I think that will be taken to heart by all those listening today. I'd like now to pass to our next speaker, and that is uh, Noel O'Connell, who has been the CEO of the European Movement Ireland since April 2011, and is Vice President of the Board of the European Movement International. Noel is also the National Citizens Representative for Ireland on the Conference of the Future of Europe plenary meetings at the European Parliament. So over to you, Noel. And since our foundation, seven decades ago, practically at this stage, European integration has resulted in an enhanced expectation and reliance on universal values and fundamental rights that are an integral part of living in the EU. And as enshrined in the Treaty on European Union, um, the Union itself is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves of that and reminding the institutions on the EU and the member states of, of those fundamental founding values. And the human rights are also protected by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which cover the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of sex, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation, the right to protection of your personal data and the right to get access to justice. Beyond these fundamental rights, however, we have seen how the EU has helped bring about stability and contributed to raising the living standards for so many of its citizens across what is now uh, post-Brexit, the 27 member states. The removal of border controls, and these are sometimes uh, rights and, and privileges that we take for granted, but that removal of border controls has allowed people to travel freely without visas, trade without tariffs, and work without permits. As members of the EU, we enjoy the right and the freedom to choose which EU member state we want to work, study or retire. 
And every member state must treat EU citizens in exactly the same way as its own citizens when it comes to matters of employment, social security and tax. While so much has been achieved by the EU since its foundation, we arrive at the Conference on the Future of Europe, as Minister Byrne outlined, at a time, it's fair to say, when Europe faces many challenges, internally and externally. These include economic issues, security and defence, climate crisis, digitalisation, health, and in all these matters, reflection, but also proactive engagement and action is required. And as the Minister outlined, uh, 2022 is a very significant year because on the 10th of May 19, uh, 1972, the country took to the polls and voted overwhelmingly in favour of our EC accession. And next year, we, we mark and celebrate 50 years of that. So today, this conference that you are participating in represents an important opportunity to give our opinions on the future direction of the EU and be involved in shaping and influencing it. And on today's topic of, of housing, and really want to, to pay tribute to Professor Kenna on this, it has been in the spotlight, but it is a case that is often repeated and witnessed, uh, as we see in other member states, people are encountering increasing difficulties in securing decent housing. And how do we reflect on this as part of the Conference on the Future of Europe? Um, lone parents, ethnic minorities, and a range of people and families across the EU are, are finding that the securing of their own home is becoming increasingly out of reach for many, particularly for our younger people. Whilst the EU holds limited responsibility in the area of housing policy, and that must be acknowledged, I think that this conference on the future of Europe could be a moment and an opportunity that change can arise because the unique space provided by the conference, it allows for conversations and discussions like today about the future of housing within the EU. And this is a major policy challenge, which is common across all member states. But how can the EU as a collective respond and act and add value to this debate? And that's where today your deliberations really matter and count. So in terms of the Conference on the Future of Europe here in Ireland, what is it about? For us here in European Movement Ireland, we are working very closely with the Minister and the Department of Foreign Affairs in carrying out national events. And our goal is to create a set of proposals based on the feedback that accurately reflect the opportunities, the challenges, the hopes, the wishes for our shared European Union identified by people living across the island of Ireland, and indeed our Irish diaspora abroad and beyond. I think the, the minister has played a crucial role in supporting and driving this work alongside colleagues and officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Taoiseach, and the institutions in terms of the European Commission and the European Parliament. And as well, a lot of credit is due to um, members of the Oireachtas involved in this process for driving and promoting it as well. So over the last number of months, we have conducted a broad and open, inclusive set of discussions about the future of Europe. We have virtually traveled uh, across the island of Ireland and really looked to encompass a diverse set of voices from across the different regions, north and south, those who've made Ireland their home and those of the Irish in Europe and beyond. And people have been coming together to share their ideas and their views and their vision for that future. Young people, minorities, islanders, Irish language organizations, cross-border communities. And really, we have been working really closely to try and work with people who don't always feel that they are heard in discussions around Europe. And then we are working with academia to develop these ideas into actionable positions that are a genuine, authentic representation of Ireland's vision for Europe's future. There has been a key trend emanating from these discussions of people wanting the EU to do more in many areas that impact their daily lives, e.g. providing supports around future pandemics, the digital transition that is fair and equitable and ensures no one is left behind, to greater adherence to environmental rules and the rule of law. From our perspective, it has been absolutely inspiring and fascinating to hear the perspectives of so many people engaging in this process. And if you have not had an opportunity already, 
I would encourage you to visit the conference's main website where oh, to date, I think they're saying about 4 million people have visited and have generated 9,000 ideas for the future of Europe. So I, I would really encourage you all to, to have a look, to get involved and have your say and upload the, the findings and the outcomes of, of today's conference. Um, it is a process that, and I really want to reiterate this, that does not belong to any one politician or any one institution, but it belongs to all of us in the European Union. And in my role as, as CEO of EM Ireland, we're really looking forward to continuing our work on the conference uh, of the future of Europe going into next year. And wearing my national citizen representative hat, really looking forward to continue to articulate and advocate on behalf of all of us here in Ireland on the conference of the future of Europe. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you here today, and I wish you well on your future deliberations for today's conference. And good morning, everyone, particularly to our attendees today. Uh, as Martin has indicated, there are three fantastic speakers for this session. We're going to focus on financing affordable housing and equal access, particularly that of gender equality. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first contributor, to Kim. And Kim, you have 10 minutes. And I'm going to be really strict with the clock to allow questions and answers afterwards. So over to All you, right. Kim. Thank you so much. And thank you so much also for the invitation. And I think it's great that you have dedicated um, this event to housing because, you know, it's a very important topic. And I'm also very happy because it's a topic dear to my heart. Um, yeah, so we've seen, you know, in the pandemic, how important a safe, healthy and comfortable home really is. People were asked to shelter in place and to work from home. And the pandemic has in the first place put a spotlight on the housing crisis in Europe. And from Warsaw to Athens, Dublin to Lisbon, more and more people simply can't afford a decent home anymore. And throughout the EU, housing prices have risen 7% in the last year. And in my own country, the Netherlands, housing prices even went up with 16%. And this while people have very often seen their income drop, and in particular people on flexible and precarious contracts have suffered. And from, for them, like... Owning their own house is often a utopian idea, while rents also keep on steadily rising faster than income. And also the quality of a lot of houses is poor. We have damp houses with poor insulation, which have severe impact on health, particularly for children. And a lot of people also live in houses that are simply too small for their families, with education going online as well. This overcrowding became even more problematic. And homelessness has been steadily increasing for the last decade. On estimate, 700,000 people sleep in the streets or in shelters every single night. And we have to move from the current default approach of ignoring, managing, or criminalizing homelessness to solving it through housing-based solutions. The housing crisis manifests itself in the first place in large cities. In cities like Lisbon, entire neighborhoods turned into ghost towns in the pandemic because tourists didn't come anymore. And this shows how much housing was actually used to accommodate tourists instead of providing a home to people living, working and studying in the city. And what we're seeing is that the rules of the market right now prevail. Governments have stopped investing in social housing and have actively invited financial investors onto their housing markets. More and more money flows into the housing market and less and less people can actually afford a home. Clearly something isn't right. And it's often the younger generations that are paying the price, turning them into generation rent. But housing is a human right, guaranteed internationally, at EU level, and in a lot of countries in the constitution. And this should be the starting point of our housing policy. To progressively realize the right to housing, we need to rein in the market forces and have the government take back control because houses are for people, not for profit. At the beginning of this year, the parliament adopted my report on decent and affordable housing for all. And this report puts housing as a human right central. I hope this can be the start of a shift of minds at the European level. And the report also recognizes that the EU has been too absent when it comes to housing. And whilst the EU will not build homes, a lot of EU policies have a major impact on the development of housing. We know that the capital markets union rules for banks, insurers, pension funds have worked as a fire accelerator for the financialization of the housing market. We also see that the current fiscal rules are putting limits on how much governments can invest in housing. 
with the European semester, we actually have a powerful tool to steer economic and social policies such as housing. But the commission, for example, has been recommending for years to shrink the Dutch social housing sector. And since the financial crisis, we have an average annual investment gap in affordable, energy efficient and social housing of 57 billion euros per year. So we need to urgently close this gap. Investments in social housing are also being limited by the state aid rules that are too restrictive on who the government can provide housing for. And these rules need to be changed. The EU can make a real difference, also in housing renovation. We know massively investing in housing renovation is good for the climate and jobs, but it also can get people out of energy poverty and into decent homes by focusing efforts on social housing and on the least energy efficient houses. And I welcome the renovation wave that was announced by the European Commission, and in particular, the affordable housing initiative that focuses on social housing. A deep renovation of 3% of the European building stock per year, improving the energy performance of these buildings by at least 60% can create 2 million jobs. And these elements should all be part of a coordinated approach to affordable and social housing at the EU level. A co concrete proposal is, for example, that the ECOFIN ministers have to meet to discuss the surge in housing prices and rent, as they have also recently discussed the rising energy prices. But since the adoption of the report, we see that some important steps have already been taken. In June, all member states adopted the Declaration on Homelessness, and it's now firmly on the agenda of the EU with a common objective to end homelessness by 2030. We are not there yet, but we need to set ambitious goals when it comes to social justice. And the Commission has also announced that it's working on rules for short-term rental platforms. And here we need strong data sharing obligations so that cities can implement and enforce their rules. And of course, the EU can, do, can only do so much. And a lot of housing policy is not in our hands. Governments and cities need to put in place better rent regulation, urban planning, favoring affordable housing, higher taxes on vacant buildings, stricter rules for transparency on home ownership. And well, I mean, I can guess I can go on for a while. Um, but, you know, we are in an interesting moment and the fight for decent and affordable housing for all is all but over. But I'm very hopeful because people are letting their voices be heard all over Europe and it gets higher on the agenda. In Berlin, the referendum on the largest landlord showed that people want the current model of speculation and financialization that needs to be changed. And in the Netherlands, 10,000s of people took to the streets and many cities to demand that houses are for people and not for poverty. I will continue working to translate the struggle from the streets and the work of the many wonderful NGOs and activists I've worked with in the last two years into policy. And I'm very happy also to hear from you what you think the EU needs to do when it comes to housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Really pertinent points there on housing as the provision of safe, secure, affordable uh, home, a right, as opposed to the commodification uh, to be traded back and forward for profit that we're seeing. And the intersection there of the financial rules and regulations really add to that tension. But I'm glad you ended on a message of hope uh, and I think you're part of that hope and the work you're doing. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sharon Dunney. And Sharon actually is going to speak directly to that financial rules and regulations piece. Uh, so Sharon, over to you for your 10 minutes contribution. And now, as you heard a little bit um, from Kim there a moment ago, challenges related uh, to the housing market, particularly around access and affordability are well known, of course, here in Ireland. But those challenges are not unique to Ireland and can also be found across Europe and indeed further afield. Um, but before I turn to that, reflecting that this event is part of the Conference on the Future of Europe, let me just take a brief moment uh, to say a few words about the role of the Central Bank of Ireland in Europe. And because, of course, the bank is deeply embedded in the institutional framework of the European Union and the euro area through, for example, the governor's membership of the governing council of the European Central Bank, our collaboration on supervision through the single supervisory mechanism and through our ongoing engagement with the European supervisory authorities and the European Systemic Risk Board. And I think for us, engaging effectively with our European colleagues and peers is key to achieving our own goals. And indeed, being open and engaged more generally is a theme of our recently published strategy for the coming years. 
And the reason for this is because we want to build trust and understanding in the role of the central bank through stronger engagement with the public, stakeholders and our peers. And I'd really like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to do just that today. Now, housing affordability pressures appear to be a challenge facing many regions globally. Just last month, the European Central Bank published their most recent financial stability review. And we can see this on the next slide, noting that house prices across the euro area rose at their fastest pace since 2005 in the second quarter of 2021. The report noted that despite the recovery in residential construction, labour shortages, global supply chain bottlenecks and input price increases are weighing on the construction sector's ability to expand housing supply, which is putting upward pressure on house prices. And in the Central Bank of Ireland, we highlighted how these issues are also affecting Ireland in our most recent financial stability review, which we published just a few weeks ago. Now, aside from the past few months, other Central Bank of Ireland research has also shown that a number of countries have seen house prices growing faster than incomes in recent years. While it's difficult to have consistent comparisons of the level of house prices relative to incomes across countries, our research does suggest that for a sample of advanced economies in recent years, relatively high levels of house prices to incomes have become a widespread phenomenon. This, of course, will not provide any great solace to those trying to purchase a home, but I do think it's important to place the Irish experience in this wider context. And these international trends do speak to the potential that global factors might also be contributing to developments in local housing markets. Our research also tried to assess housing costs across the population in the round, using a range of survey sources, rather than focusing solely on house price and rental indices, which measure new transaction activity only. Focusing on the rental market, for example, costs are high in Ireland, and this impacts those with lower incomes particularly hard. In that context, our research has shown that in Ireland, there is a particularly high share of households that have subsidised rents. This likely, in part, explains why, across advanced economies, the share of lower income households who have a very high rental burden in Ireland does not appear to be materially out of line with other OECD countries. But of course, this doesn't take away from the very real challenges for the individuals that I mentioned earlier, particularly for new tenants, for whom rental costs have increased significantly in Ireland, and for those renting who may also be trying to save up for a deposit to purchase a home. Now, as we're discussing today, housing policy is a complex area where elected governments have a primary role to play. There are many actors in the housing market, including households, developers and investors, as well as governments and financial entities such as banks. But you may be wondering what role central banks have. So if we turn to the next slide. There are many important links to our primary role on price stability, but one particular area where central banks have a more direct role is overseeing the role that the financial system plays in the housing market. When someone wishes to purchase a home, they often need access to mortgage finance. And this intermediation is an important and valuable role that the financial system plays. However, this financial intermediation also entails risks that need to be managed for lenders, for borrowers, and for the entire economy. Because left unchecked, excessive risk taking in the mortgage market can lead to financial instability, and indeed has done repeatedly through the course of history. So here at the Central Bank of Ireland, we have a specific mandate with respect to financial stability. And our overall aim is to ensure that the financial system can absorb rather than amplify adverse shocks and that banks can continue to serve households and businesses through times of stress. Now in the next slide, you'll see some of the key tools we have to achieve this aim. And these are called macroprudential policies. The policies have the most visible impact on the housing market are referred to as borrower based measures. And it's fair to say that these policies have become common across Europe, particularly since the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And here in Ireland, as many of you will know, we introduced our own mortgage measures in 2015. So for Europe, if we take the European economic area and the UK, 23 countries out of 31 have a so-called loan to value limit which limits how much can be borrowed relative to the value of a property, while 17 countries, including Ireland, have a loan to income or debt service to income limit. Now, overall, these measures limit how large repayments on a loan can be with respect to a borrower's income. 
And the idea behind this is to link developments in the housing market to developments in people's real incomes, as well as to ensure that mortgages are at a lower risk of becoming unaffordable. In Ireland, our mortgage measures, which are described on the next slide, are integral par a part of our Irish macroprudential policy framework. And they have two objectives, to increase the resilience of banks and borrowers to negative shocks and to prevent the re-emergence of a damaging credit house price spiral. Put more simply, our aim is that borrowers don't take on unsustainable amounts of debt and banks don't give out unsustainable amounts of credit. This is so that through the highs and the lows of the economic cycle, the financial system is stable and sustainable but importantly, can continue to serve the needs of the people of Ireland. The costs of not meeting these objectives were particularly clear during and after the previous financial crisis and can be seen on the next slide. The effects of the crisis in Ireland were particularly severe, with the unemployment rate increasing by over 10 percentage points to peak at about 16% in 2011, 2012, while property prices fell by over 50% from their peak from 2007 to 2013. The financial crisis left significant scars across all segments of the Irish economy and society, some of which are still relevant today, including a legacy of individuals and households who remain in difficult situations with respect to mortgages that they drew down before the crisis. One minute, Sharon. Now, I've previously outlined the rationale for borrower-based measures in economies, which I believe is clear. And the benefits of the mortgage measures were evident over the past year, as the resilience built up since their introduction helped to protect both borrowers and lenders during the COVID-19 crisis. However, in the central bank, we are acutely aware that the mortgage measures directly affect individuals and families, including their decisions about potentially purchasing a home. So given that we place the public interest at the heart of our policy approach, we are continuously trying to strike an appropriate balance between the benefits that the mortgage measures play in ensuring sustainable lending for housing and the potential costs that they impose across the economy. So having briefly discussed the role of central banks in the Irish housing market in a wider context, where should policymakers focus? Well, looking at the Irish housing market and considering whether there is enough supply to meet demand, I believe the answer is clear. Demand for housing is strong, and supply has not kept pace. But I've said before that what is needed in housing markets is a sustainable level of supply. For central banks, our direct role relates to ensuring the sustainable provision of mortgage finance. Because the fact is that unsustainable levels of credit will not lead to a sustainable supply of new homes. If anything, it risks the re-emergence of a credit price spiral and another painful boom bust housing cycle. The challenges facing the wider housing market around sustainability of supply and house price affordability would not be addressed by excessive indebtedness of households or imprudent lending. So overall, I think housing policy should focus on the sustainable supply of housing to meet the growing needs of citizens across Ireland and Europe. And the EU does have a role here, I think particularly around the green transition, for example, as existing homes will need to become more energy efficient to meet our climate change goals. However, tackling supply constraints will rightly remain primarily within the remit of national and even more so local policymakers. Thank you. So if we turn to my final slide, let me just briefly wrap up by saying every year since 2016, the Central Bank has reviewed our mortgage measures against their stated objectives. And we did this again just quite recently in 2021. But we're also currently in the process of doing something significant different in parallel, which is an overarching review of the entire framework around our mortgage measures. At its core, this review will reflect the bank's mission to maintain monetary and financial stability. And the areas we focus on will be determined by listening to our stakeholders, lessons learned from experiences across the globe, and an assessment of the key changes in the housing market and the wider economic environment since we introduced the measures in 2015. Our decisions will ultimately be guided by extensive evidence based analysis and the public interest. Many thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that a very detailed presentation. I think it's very, very helpful to understand that. Uh, and the key message there around a balance of supply and demand into the future, a big, big challenge for us. Uh, our final speaker is Michaela, uh, coming from the city of Vienna. 
Um, Michaela's going to talk a little bit about housing and gender. So again, 10 minutes, Michaela, and over to you. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be in Ireland, even if only virtually. And I'm really hoping forward to, you know, repair this uh, soon because I need to go to Ireland again. It's a lovely country and with a lot of great and bright people. So uh, really missing you. Um, okay. My task today was a little bit uh, complicated in a way because I, would, I was asked to reframe a little bit the whole issue of housing, the future of Europe conference and, uh, and gender equality indeed. Because uh, when, when Kenna, Patrick Kenna and I were, were in contact, we really felt that the gender dimension of the whole discussion, both in housing policies and in the future of Europe, uh, debate are a little bit, you know, uh, there's room to improve. So what I would like to do with you today, and if, if I could have my first slide, please. Coming from Vienna, typically you are, and working for the city, typically you are an urban feminist. And uh, what, I'm, what do I mean by that? I mean that we are really hold up to, to take uh, into account the gender dimension in all policy fields, and this since quite long. So when I listened now to, to, to Sharon, I was always asking myself, uh, are you, I mean, I'm sure you have that, but is there a difference, for instance, between women and men apply, uh, applying for loans? And how often are women rejected uh, because of their, their, their smaller incomes uh, by banks to get a loan? So these are questions that for me are with regard to gender equality, really, really important also, uh, where I do see a role for central banks to see into the policy of, of banks overall as how women would be you know, able to get loans, to set up a business, buy a home, whatever. So that's, that was what was popping up in, as a question to, to Sharon already <laughs> when I heard you. Uh, but coming back to a little bit to, to what, what, what do I do, to, do I do with you or to, to you today? I'd like to do a little bit of a feminist reframe a little bit general but we have 2021 and uh, I think that when we discuss and debate and think about the future of our societies whatever policy field we're, we're discussing it doesn't work if we do not uh, if, if we do not take into account uh, the, the half of humanity if we see that half of humanity and that's the women the, the bigger part of the of the of, of humanity remains invisible so often now, I know that in the conference uh, of the future, on the future of Europe, a lot is going on, but still, if you just, you know, would Google that, you would see that there is little, little explicitly done about women's rights and gender equality. Democracy, uh, to start with the first thing, uh, one number is interesting enough. There are more mayors in Austria called Joseph than women leading their local communities. And in Europe, the picture is even more awkward because it's only 16% of mayors who are female and only a third of all local councillors who are female. Now we all know the numbers, more than half of the population is female. So we do not have a representativity in representative democracy here. And I'm very happy to have uh, Alison Gillian here because as a, as a Lord Mayor, you are the 10th, as I heard in a long history of Lord Mayors of your city. Uh, still in my city, Vienna, we didn't have any female mayors yet, yeah, uh, but I hope that this is something we can give as a vision to the next generation, uh, at least. Uh, now we also know, and this is something where I would wish also a stronger point with the conference on the future of Europe, clearly, that the only thing that can really change this is introduction of quotas. We've seen it in the, the example of the French departmental elections. Only 13% uh, of all the elected representatives were female, like more than 10 years ago, but then they introduced a clear rule to have quotas for women. And they had half of the women, now, uh, half of the representatives being women after that came in. So quota are, I think, the only thing that we need to implement at, that is necessary and that can help. And what we also see even now with, with, uh, with uh, the, ch the change in, in Germany, a one, one, uh, strong woman left as head of government. We have a new woman in, in, uh, in, in uh, Sweden now, but that means that of all the 27 EU member states, we only have three heads of government who are female. 
So if I can have the next slide, this was just to give you a little bit of a, an appetite to discuss democracy also with a strong gender equality dimension from different angles. Now, when it comes to housing, I also want to put this in a bit of a bigger context, because very often we talk about housing and we talk of the construction or renovation of buildings. But what I think what we can learn also from Vienna, my city, is that you have to also reframe a little bit the context and talk about urban development and neighborhood development. We have seen that cities historically have been built according to the needs of those who are in power. And that mostly was the female population. We've seen that the public sphere is dominated by men. And I mean this literally when you look, for instance, as, uh, street names, square names, who are the statutes that our kids are, are maybe painting sometimes, but <laughs> the statutes in the public sphere, how many men, how many women? And if women, is it, you know, naked, maybe goddesses or, 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 or beautiful statutes, or is it, representatives of the society. So look around in your city with open eyes and then you will see if the public sphere is dominated by men also in this very, very context. This is something we're trying to change very much in Vienna, especially when it comes to renaming the streets. Uh, but we also, if we go closer into the living environment of people, also homes, homes, the architecture of, of, of flats, is as well designed to reinforce and prolong gender stereotypes, meaning that there is a place for the woman, which is the kitchen, there is the representative space of the man, there is also a bigger, bigger, normally bedroom for the parents and smaller bedrooms for the kitchen. I just mentioned this because also on that, we have done a lot of work in Vienna in trying to reorganize the, 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 the architecture so that it enables more uh, uh, equality in, 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 uh, in, I would say, in, in, in daily life, yeah? We have also seen that homes have become really crucial in times of, of the pandemic. They became kindergartens, schools, workplaces, and I don't mention that, or, or, or no, I mention it because it, that means that it tripled and quadrupled the burden that was on women. And it has also led to, sadly, to being very unsafe places when it comes to partner violence. And I remind everybody that we're still in the, in the 50, 16 days against uh, gender-based violence now until the 10th of December. So this is why I mention it also today. So clearly, and again, talking about housing affordability, we have to see there is a gender dimension because as long as we have this big gender pay, pay gap and this big gender pension gap, we will have to see into, into that as well. It's a relation between incomes and costs. And uh, there is a lot of, of also academic work going on on that. So that means uh, there is a clear gender dimension in housing affordability. The more this goes, as we see now, for the energy poverty. Energy poverty is really an issue because the rising energy prices, the inflation that we are seeing at the moment all over the place is affecting women again in, to a much higher extent. Uh, so here we need to have more focus also on European level with regard to energy poverty in the last uh, uh, new uh, ruling about how to combat energy poverty of the European Union, there is no mention of gender inequalities. That's a pity because a lot of, of also very, I wouldn't say this is the, the very progressive feminist NGO, it's the European Court of Auditors that recommends to the European the commission especially to take up more steps uh, to engender their budget and to gender mainstream uh, the EU budget. And in that context, I would say that there is again, room to maneuver. Can I have my last slide please? Now coming to the Future of Europe conference and I'll be quite brief and but a little bit bold again on that. Um, clearly we've heard that in the beginning uh, the Conference of, of Europe is, should be a unique and timely opportunity for European citizens to debate on Europeans' challenges and priorities. Now, I don't see, and I must uh, see, say this with great regret, that to my, um, in my opinion, in my conviction, one of the biggest challenges Europe faces is rising gender inequality and a backlash to human rights. If you look at the conference uh, events list, 
there is a very, very few events going at, you know, towards gender issues. Very often it's related to family issues. Again, reinforcing that stereotype that when you talk about families, you talk about women and that's fine. It's not. Uh, clearly there is a little bit on unemployment and education. And I've, I've only found one event related to housing and this is today's event. So congrats at least to, to link that and to make the link also to women's rights. So what I would see, and, and that would be a role that I, I, I would like to have even stronger in the, in the conference of, uh, on the future of Europe. There is no debate on institutional change. How can we empower citizens? How can we change a little bit the, to, to implement more gender equality via quota in the European Parliament's elections, for instance? Uh, there is uh, really nothing going on in that field. As, a, as an urban person, as a city representative, I also would like to see how can we better involve cities and regions in EU decision making. That's another topic. Um, and the other, other thing is, I think that we, we should also talk about women's rights related to the big instruments that we have now, like the EU Justice Scoreboard has already been mentioned, the EU Euro, rule of law mechanism. These important new mechanisms, everybody's talking about the rule of law, do not really have a gender equality dimension yet. So if we continue like we do at the moment, I think the future for, 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 of Europe will not be feminist. And then we could just say, okay, maybe we should just start pay our daughters less pocket money than our boys, because that may, would make them, you know, get used to the injustice of future income patterns uh, for, for, their future, for their lives. Or shouldn't we rather take an approach to empower and encourage them by giving them more female role models in politics, economy, and society, as we have seen in this panel. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Michaela. That was fantastic. And I think you hit the nail on the head there around our systems. They're designed around the male stereotype of going out to work and coming home in the evening and the, the woman's in the house there make a dinner on the table and the children all looked after. And you know, it's really hard to break that system. I am a fan of gender quotas. I think it's the only way forward and we really have to actually increase them and strengthen them, not just in politics, but across company boards, institutions, all of that until we eventually get that balance for better. So thank you for that. Um, I have a few questions here. Uh, I have a comment from Kira, who says that many friends and family members are either delaying having children or deciding not to have children altogether because of the cost of housing, including herself. So we really need to see a drastic decrease in housing prices driven by an increase in housing supply. Uh, so that is a very pertinent comment, and I think it's one that has been captured in many reports, particularly by TASC here in Ireland. Uh, another question I have from Barbara uh, is about rents. Uh, rents in Ireland are now rising at an annual rate of 6.8%. The stock of homes to rent is between 70 and 80% lower than one year ago. And time, is it time to rent, implement rent control and rent stabilization mechanisms in order to stop further speculation, inflation and protect tenants? So you might hold that question. Uh, and I'm going to add in the question that you raised, um, Michaela, specifically for Sharon, men and women applying for mortgages. Is, do you have a gender data there, Sharon, and is there a trend? So those two questions about rents to Michaela, Kim and Sharon, but also the specific one about mortgage applications on a gender perspective to you, Sharon. So Kim, I might go back to you on the rents there. Well, I think when, when we're talking about rents, um, it's very important that we see it as a part of our life expenses, right? Um, it's, uh, uh, and I think for a long time, we have agreed with each other that having, you know, a quarter of your income or a third of your income to be spent on, um, rent, but also energy combination of that is something that we can agree on, but not more. But when we're looking at the average rent right now in Europe, um, we're reaching 40% or higher. Um, and that is, you know, and that means that all the other things, I mean, making sure you get food on the table, etc. 
um, uh, has to go from that other part. Um, and, and that is something that is indeed people, you know, stalling people's um, development. It's stopping people from indeed taking big decisions because they don't simply can't um, save up money. And I think that is also the reason why, why we adopted generation rent. You have to pay so much rent that you can't save up to in the end, you know, um, have um, uh, money enough to get a mortgage to buy a house. So you're just stuck in this vicious cycle. Um, and I don't think, you know, the utopia of, you know, everyone having, um, having their own house is something that um, we have to strive for per se. There's plenty of people who prefer living in a rental home, but we have to, you know, be realistic and say, okay, the, the rents are rising. It's not like something that's better. And actually, um, in many large cities in the Netherlands right now, it's cheaper to own a house but people can't get out of the rental system because they have to pay so much money. Um, so I think it's really important that we look at this. And I think in Europe, we have to strive for having um, lower rents and then really as part of the income. So look, so try to strive, in my opinion, to go to the 25% um, of uh, how much uh, you Thank spent you. On, uh, right. on rent. Yeah, it, we, we would have a similar case here in Ireland, Kim, where uh, rent is higher than a mortgage. So Sharon, over to you about that gender piece on mortgage, but also that dichotomy around house ownership and striving to get a mortgage. In my view here in Ireland, it's because we don't have that secure, affordable rental system that should be public housing, but more we're more depending on the market in Ireland and, and other countries like Holland. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the questions. Um, so on the gender issues, I, I don't have uh, data to hand to explicitly answer Michaela's question, but I think her point in general um, is true. So we see very stark differences between men and women um, in the economy, for example, in labour force participation, um, in levels of average incomes, in things like gender pay gaps and so on. So we do see uh, important differences economically, I think, um, across genders. Maybe the issue for the mortgage measures more specifically, though, is we do have this important um, system of exceptions where individual borrowers can look for um, an exception from the rule, the rules. And in that case, they're very specific and individual circumstances, including, for example, their own specific income uh, and so on is taken into account as part of the, the process uh, with the lenders when they're looking for a mortgage. Um, on rental then, I mean, I think um, you mentioned, um, Lord Mayor, the point in the question about supply. So, of course, um, rent controls can be an important part of, of the response to challenges in the rental market. But I think the part of the question that also um, referred to the decline in supply, I think, is really key. And we have seen a very significant decline in supply um, in rents, particularly in urban areas, but of course, more generally um, in Ireland as well. And, and as Kim mentioned, that's seen uh, more across uh, Europe. And I think that brings me back to this issue of a sustainable supply of housing. And as you rightly point out, in Ireland, there is a tendency, I think, um, to emphasise home ownership over rental. That's partly, of course, historical and partly cultural. But I think you're right, also partly to do, to do with concerns about security of tenure and so on. So I suppose overall, um, it's about having, I think, joined up coherent policy, of course, that looks at these things in a sort of more sustainable way um, over a, a medium term perspective, which, of course, I think is the reason why we're here in terms of talking about these issues. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Michaela, I'm not actually going to bring you in on this one. I'm going to give you a completely different question because I'm conscious of time. It's what do we do about Airbnb? Uh, and the potential long term rentals that have been taken up by short term rents uh, of units that are promoting themselves as Airbnb. So maybe you could speak a little bit about your experience on that. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think it's a very important point. And we have seen a whole movement of cities um, and regions uh, actually across Europe um, just before the pandemic that was starting where, whereby local communities, local politicians try to protect their housing markets from this, I would say, touristification of their housing markets. And um, I think that, um, I mean, the pandemic stopped a little bit the business model of Airbnb, but it's coming back as, as uh, the colleague wrote in the, in the question Q&A. So what I think is that we have seen now very good examples like in Paris, yeah, uh, that really went uh, against Airbnb until the Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, 
And they said, okay, it's, it's allowed, the court allows the city of Paris to protect their housing markets. And that's really a key decision at the moment on the European level. And what happens now is that a lot of cities and partners like Kim van Sparentak in the European Parliament are now working together to have a new, um, new proposal of the commission, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act to control those platforms and to give you know, cities back the right to know what's going on in their territories. And touristification is you know, just one part of the, I would say, um, devilish trinity that is called touristification, financialization and gentrification. It's all one thing and it's induced by global investment basically. And we need to see that there has to be something done about it because this is again, creating those skyrocketing prices that we see in our markets. Yeah, I think there was a stage in Dublin where we had more families living in hotels because they were homeless and we had tourists in homes. And it just shows you the absolute perverseness of where we're at. Kim, you wanted to come in on that? Yes, because um, uh, it was announced quite recently that we're actually having um, a short-term uh, holiday rental regulation coming up uh, soon um, in the European Union. It will be published in March. Um, and that is also very much thanks to the amazing work of all these big cities who told the commission, it's not okay that these platforms are taking over our city. We can't do anything about it. Um, so I think that's that's amazing news. We now have um, a proposal for Digital Services Act that will give enough provisions, hopefully, to make sure that Airbnb is, um, you know, at least obliged to to share some data with cities. And then we will have a specific regulation to uh, to make sure that cities get, uh, you know, some power back over who owns their houses. Okay. Okay. I'm going to end on one question for each of you. It's the same one. And it's around recognizing, we, I think we all recognize the challenges in this, but at a European level, in your view, what can and should be done to ensure more affordable, accessible, secure, long-term homes? And I go to you, Michaela, first. No, but I would suggest the, the answer could be first, acknowledge that we need more diversity in all our housing markets. Because at the moment we are discussing a very, I would say limiting, also intellectually limiting uh, binary system and that there is only home ownership, owner occupied home ownership, and there's only rental. And mostly this is not true because I'm coming from Vienna and you have a big sector of public municipal cooperative housing. And I think that if the European Union would promote more of these more diverse solutions, we could really, really get out of the problem. I'm currently working, for instance, with the Association of Slovenian Cities who want to set up a cooperative housing model. So a lot is going on to re-establish or to introduce these more participatory models of housing. And it's, if you don't like the word cooperative because you are from post-communist uh, tradition, then you can say co-housing, whatever, but you, we need these kind of models because they are financially sustainable. The money that is there is reinvested into the cooperative. It's a shared uh, responsibility of, and it's shared also risks. And it's very little risky because it's super boring, long-term financial models. And I'm sure that Sharon loves these kind of models with regard to macro prudential economic behavior of them, you know. So I think that this is this is one thing that we really should acknowledge. The European Union for long has only said housing is for the or social housing is only for the very poor and vulnerable groups. Look, go go to Vienna. Go to Vienna and see people are proud to live in social housing. They are not ashamed to have an address that is connected to municipal building. So this is my first thing. And the second thing is, I think that we can do a lot to the block investment in the EU's level, but I leave that to Kim now because we, the time is running. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I go to Kim, I'll go to you, Sharon. On that um, cool. well, maybe, but, thank you. Uh, maybe building up what Kayla said there, there are different parts or different subsectors of the housing market so we talk generally about housing but there are these important differences between home ownership rental social housing and so on 
And from our point of view at the central bank, as I mentioned in my remarks, the financial system should not be here to serve the needs of the financial system itself. The financial system is here to serve the needs of the economy and to serve the needs of citizens. Um, so I think one of the key contributions, of course, the European Union makes to the financial system is how it's regulated by central banks and, and regulators. Um, and in thinking about how we regulate the financial system, I think it needs to be very much focused on the needs of citizens uh, and achieving those in a way that's sustainable and provides for a stable economy. And in fact, the, the things that are mentioned here, like changing business models and um, Airbnb, digitalization, these kinds of things, these are also happening in the financial system. So we see massive changes in the financial financial system um, as a result of new innovation and so on. And a lot of that brings many positive things. Um, but this, of course, also brings challenges for the economy and citizens. And again, there, I think uh, regulation and so on has to also focus on making sure that the financial system meets the needs of citizens uh, and that citizens and economies get what they need uh, out of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, I would be of the view that a stable, affordable housing system actually supports a stable economy very much. So, Kim, last word to you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll just keep it short. I think, you know, we have to start with acknowledging and treating housing as a human right. Because for so long, like we're just counting on the market to solve everything. We we're, we're, we're prefer, preferring, you know, having money flow through the European Union to, for, for big investors to buy up houses. And we're totally neglecting the fact that there's people who have to live in those places and have to actually have a home. So I think that's where we have to start, treating it as a fundamental right. And from that lens, really look at all these points also that Michaela and Sharon mentioned. We have to change the financialization and we have to stop using it as just an asset. We have to start treating housing as a fundamental right. And um, if we start doing that, I think very a lot of good things can, uh, can start happening. So for our second session this morning, um, I'm pleased to invite to be our moderator, our very own NUIG colleague, Professor Porig Kenner. Um, Porig is the organizer of the event, so we've got a lot to thank him for in putting today's event together. Um, he lectures on housing and property law, NUI Galway, and publishes and presents widely on housing law, rights and policy, particularly in the EU context. Um, uh, there, it's good to have the space to speak about homelessness in this uh, important event. Um, I followed um, um, the guidelines for the speakers, so I will try to answer the question, um, uh, uh, what is the European Union doing good, uh, what is the European, doing, uh, European Union doing bad, or uh, what can be improved, and uh, where do uh, I where would I like to be in uh, 10 to 20 years? But let me first say um, uh, two words about, uh, about Feansa. Uh, Feansa is the uh, only European NGO uh, that works exclusively on the issue of homelessness. Of course, there's other European NGOs that touch upon homelessness from time to time, or that, important, that represent important stakeholders in the fight against homelessness, but the uh, European NGO that exclusively works on homelessness is not uh, Feansa. And it's a multi-stakeholder uh, platform. It started off as a sort of a trade union of the shelter sector um, more than 30 years ago. But now we have diversified our membership. Um, most are NGOs, most are providers of uh, hostel accommodation, shelter and hostel accommodation. But increasingly, we also have cities, social housing companies, foundations, etc., as members. Uh, the idea is to bring together in one and the same place uh, all the stakeholders you need to actually progress towards solving uh, homelessness. And uh, even if we do quite a bit of lobbying and advocacy work, our main focus is on knowledge generation and knowledge building uh, and research. Uh, uh, because most, I think it's important because most of the policies in place uh, at European, uh, in Europe, in, at local or national level uh, are too little evidence-based. And I think the um, production of knowledge, the promotion of knowledge can actually have quite a big impact on uh, homeless policies. So uh, what is the European Union uh, at the moment doing well uh, on homelessness? Well, there's three things that I can mention. There's many things that they do well, but uh, there's three things that are worth mentioning here. First of all, it created a favorable policy context for more EU action on the issue of homelessness uh, in the future. Um, uh, like um, uh, uh, was just announced, um, the European Union uh, launched the EU platform for combating homelessness. Uh, it's a new initiative. It's an official uh, new initiative uh, just in June, uh, a couple of months ago. What is important about that uh, is that um, uh, this platform is supported by all 27 EU member states. Um, it's rare uh, that you get in the current uh, European Union, all member states 
supporting more EU action on a social issue. So I think um, we should uh, make the best out of that. But not only the member states, also EU institutions and the most, uh, so like um, uh, the European Parliament, the Economic and Social Committee, the Committee of the Regions um, uh, have signed up um, uh, to the platform as well as a number of other European stakeholders like NGOs and social partners. And they all signed the Lisbon Declaration, which underpins the work of this platform. And there, uh, there are two important things in the Lisbon Declaration. There is, first of all, a commitment of all these partners, including all EU member states, to work together at EU level, and a commitment of the European Commission to facilitate that work. And secondly, uh, the ambition to uh, uh, make substantial progress towards ending homelessness by 2030. Even if we don't end homelessness by 2030, switching from managing homelessness in the shelter sector to ending homelessness, that sort of paradigm shift would already be a great achievement. The second thing is um, that uh, the European Union created unprecedented opportunities to use EU funding and financing for the fight against homelessness. I'm not going into detail, but there is the REACT EU program, uh, which relates to the old ESF and FAIL programs. There is the European Social Fund Plus, the new one that runs now, uh, the European Regional Development Fund, and even Invest EU, uh, which is about loans and uh, guarantees. There is in these um, uh, uh, funding programs explicit and implicit references to homelessness, uh, homeless people as a target group uh, uh, in the, 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 the laws underpinning these um, uh, financing uh, and funding instruments. That's real, that's, that, that's real opportunities and that's quite unique. It, it was not the case uh, uh, in the past. Uh, homeless policy, uh, um, uh, the, the fact that member states have to have homeless policy is integrated as an enabling condition uh, for some of these funds, it means that they can only spend the funds if they have uh, a homeless policy uh, in place. And a homeless people helped are an output indicator, for instance, for the ESF Plus. That will make it easier to actually use uh, the funds um, in practice for the fight against homelessness. And even there is some ring fencing of budgets of some of the funds. There's 3% uh, of the ESF Plus reserved for the most deprived, which are um, uh, defined as including homeless people, and in the child, uh, and five percent should go to the child guarantee, the EU child guarantee, which includes uh, homeless families uh, as a target group, as one of the six target groups, at least in those countries that have a child poverty rate which is more than average. And the third thing that the European Union is doing well, I think, is, and I don't want to be like I said in all modesty, of course is that it funded FIANSA for more than 30 years in a structural way. Uh, and apart from the fact that it gives me a job, which is of course great, uh, it has allowed us to build a strong knowledge base and a network uh, of organizations working on homeless people and experts. Uh, and that can be used as the building blocks for this EU uh, platform. And we're happy to offer these building blocks. So what can the EU do better? Um, uh, there is one point more, four points, but I'll go through them quickly. I think the European Union can do better in mainstreaming homelessness in other policy areas. Uh, at the moment, um, the platform is led by DG Employment of the European Commission, which is, of course, a very important DG. Um, but it means that the focus is very much on the competences that are held by DG Employment, child guarantee, disability, etc. And I think it's really, really important if you want to have real impact on homelessness that you have to enlarge to migration and asylum anti-discrimination, health, etc. Uh, there is, uh, these are big priorities for the European Union and homelessness needs a place there. And it is actually not yet integrated in the EU Migration Pact, in the EU Gender Equality Strategy, and not even in the EU Health Union. So that's one thing that can improve. The other thing that can improve is the strengthening of the human rights monitoring. I think it's really about time that we enlarge the role of the Fundamental Rights Agency to really work on social rights, including the right to housing. At the moment, um, uh, there is some kind of a straitjacket uh, imposed on the Fundamental Rights Agency um, uh, that relates to anti-discrimination. Everything has to be related to anti-discrimination. Anti-discrimination is, of course, important, but it doesn't capture uh, all uh, human rights violations, and it is difficult to capture homelessness with anti-discrimination uh, approach. So that's one call, uh, uh, one thing that can improve. The second thing is that there should be more support for European NGOs and other NGOs um, uh, to engage in strategic human rights litigation. Um, there is no money, or I'm not aware of any money available for that. And actually, it's worse. Um, we are funded by DG Employment uh, in a structural way. We get an operating grant, and um, uh, we're not allowed to use that public money uh, to enter into human rights litigation. Uh, uh, that definitely has to change. The third thing is that the European Commission 
and European Union should consider legislative means to address and prevent homelessness. Like there is always a tendency to move to soft policy instruments and that's fine. Learning can really uh, have impact, research can really have impact, but there is also legislative means. And I think we can build on some of the um, uh, 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 EU laws, directives that exist and that mention homelessness. For instance, access to basic banking services. Homeless people are mentioned as a target group. Access to water. Homeless people are mentioned as a target group. So why not move to uh, some kind of a legal initiative to guarantee access to emergency shelter for homeless people? Um, it exists already for asylum seekers in EU legislations. It might come at European level for women fleeing gender-based violence if the Istanbul Convention gets integrated into uh, EU law. Uh, why not for homeless people? Like you don't want shelters uh, at the front door to make a difference between asylum seekers, women fleeing domestic violence and other uh, homeless people. So I think there is a case to be made for a guaranteed access to shelter uh, at EU level uh, integrated yeah. in law. Uh, and then I think the fourth thing is that we should apply the do no harm principle. Um, uh, even if the European Union has no direct competence in the area of housing, and probably that's a good thing, uh, it can play a bigger role to avoid the negative impact of the policies that impact on housing uh, affordability. I'm not going into detail, there's other people that are more expert than me. And so the final slide is, what does the ideal Europe look like for homelessness in the next 10 years? Uh, Porek said next 10 to 20 years, but really I don't feel capable to look 20 years ahead, so I restricted myself to 10 years. I hope that by then the European platform on homelessness is a key part of EU social policy instruments that we don't have to fight to keep it going, to keep homelessness on the agenda, that it's proactively led by the European Commission. I think there is some work to be done there uh, still. The European Commission is hesitating about how proactive uh, they want to lead this platform, how ambitious they want to be. That abundant or at least sufficient funding is available at EU level for both mutual learning and for policies and services on the ground uh, via the uh, EU funds and EU financing mechanisms. Uh, and that Hopefully, fiance is made redundant by then. Uh, even if that uh, uh, gets me out of a uh, out of a job, I think um, uh, that is uh, that would be a sign that we're making real progress. The second thing is that I hope that member states by then will have made substantial progress towards ending homelessness, and that there is some kind of a systemic change to housing-led approaches with a clear focus on the prevention, so that we don't constantly fall back on the shelter system to manage uh, homelessness, but that we really move to, uh, towards ending it. And the last thing is that the social function of housing takes priority or has taken priority over the economic function in EU policy. Um, because there is an over, um, a strong reliance on the economic, on the economic functions of, uh, uh, of housing and too little on social function, even if we see some um, reasons to be hopeful, reasons that it's going to change. And something very practical in that sense is that I hope that the Green Deal, which is a big priority for the European Union, will be a success by then, but also for poor homeowners and poor tenants, social as well as in the private uh, uh, sector. Because I think there is a lot of initiatives on the table that might have a huge impact, negative impact on poor homeowners and tenants. Uh, so if these three, three things uh, come true, I would be a happy man. Our next speaker is Dara Turnbull, who, who works with uh, Housing Europe, and um, the, the floor is yours, Dara. Uh, so the state of, firstly, uh, who is Housing Europe? Well, Housing Europe is the European Federation of Public Cooperative and Social Housing. Uh, we represent providers of um, affordable housing right across Europe, both inside and outside the European Union. Uh, and in the Irish context, we, uh, represent, we are represented by the Irish Council for Social Housing and Cooperative Housing Ireland. So the State of Housing in Europe 2021, uh, it's a report which we publish uh, every two years. Um, this report came out back in the first part of this year, usually comes in the second part, but given the, the impact on COVID, we really wanted to push forward that release to uh, cat categorize and catalog some of the uh, early impacts we saw from the COVID pandemic on the housing market. Uh, indeed, what challenges that has highlighted, because I think we all realize uh, in the past year and a half or so, um, that maybe many of the things we, we thought about where we live and how we live actually are not adequate. Maybe we don't have enough light, maybe we don't have enough um, uh, access to local amenities and so on. And I think many people have lear quickly learned that a, a home uh, is not necessarily also an office and a creche, as well as being a place to live and relax and to, uh, to enjoy yourself. 
Um, so indeed, the report uh, discussed many different challenges across Europe. Most of these challenges, if indeed not all of these challenges, existed prior to the pandemic. What the pandemic has effectively done uh, is really highlight the fault lines between the haves and the have nots in terms of housing access and quality and so on uh, across Europe. So to give you a few of the issues that we mentioned, 18% um, of adults in the EU today spend 30% or more of their disposable income on housing. Um, so there's been a very strong growth in house prices over the past decade, uh, more than 30% uh, for house prices and about 15% for private rents. Uh, over the last decade to the end of 2020. And again, that's just an EU national uh, picture. Uh, to give you another uh, issue, those figures again are, are national, uh, but they don't, they can hide very important dichotomies. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have really good, high quality, comparable data uh, at EU level in terms of housing affordability issues within the cities, which would be very interesting to have. And indeed, and indeed uh, we heard from Kim Van Sparentak earlier on. And one of the key recommendations of her report is that we do improve drastically the quality of the data that we have uh, in terms of housing affordability and so on. So this just very quickly is a chart that uh, myself and my colleagues at Housing Europe put together a few weeks ago, which tried to estimate uh, the housing affordability for a typical kind of a young couple uh, in, in many different EU cities. And you see that if we set 30% as the threshold, that's the bottom uh, orange line, that indeed very, very few cities can consider themselves to be affordable. Uh, just to highlight the case of Dublin, a one-bedroom uh, apartment would, would be about 35.7% of your disposable income, uh, whereas a two-bedroom apartment would be about 43.8%. And uh, Dublin is certainly not alone in terms of those affordability challenges. Um, one of the other issues that we really highlighted in the state of housing was uh, the lack of supply of housing and the unmet need for housing, both uh, ordinary housing, private rental and, and home ownership, but also indeed in the uh, social and affordable housing sphere. So some of the figures we highlight is about a three and a half million unit deficit of housing uh, in England, at least one million units in Germany, although those figures are now a few years old, uh, approximately 330,000 uh, additional units required in the Netherlands, uh, and about 165,000 shortfall in Ireland in the years leading up to the pandemic. Uh, the report also highlighted a number of other issues which are coming to the fore. Uh, particularly around the aging population and the housing requirements that will have uh, going forward. So many countries in Europe are now beginning to think uh, about how they house and, and what the housing requirements will be of an aging population. Uh, and indeed, one of the trends which we expect to come out of the COVID pandemic is what they call deinstitutionalization, meaning that people will stay in their homes and be cared for in their homes, more so than moving into nursing homes or um, some form of later life care. So we need to start thinking now about how we can accommodate those sorts of challenges going forward. Uh, persistent homelessness is also a huge issue, um, which Freik uh, very eloquently outlined in his presentation, so I won't, uh, I won't touch on that. Um, another thing is the significant public and private funding gap for housing development uh, and renovation. So report, the Prodi report from a few years ago estimated that the annual funding gap for, for social and affordable housing uh, in the EU was roughly 56 billion euro per year uh, versus what would need to be spent uh, actually to meet the demand for social and affordable forms of housing. Uh, the other issue I've been asked to talk about today is the this idea of greener homes and more sustainable homes and what the role of the EU uh, can play in that. So indeed, uh, we know that homes are responsible for about one quarter of the final energy consumption in the EU. So if we are serious about climate change, if we are seriously about getting to net zero, um, then indeed homes will be an integral part of, the, of meeting that challenge. Having said that, the European Commission currently estimates that the annual funding gap in terms of uh, spending on home renovations and uh, climate sustainability in the, in the residential housing sector versus what's needed to actually get towards net zero uh, is about 115 billion euro a year across the European Union. That's, a, that's an incredibly significant amount of money um, when you think about that's on an annual basis. Um, the national recovery plans, most of which have now been finalised, uh, do show some improvement um, uh, ambition in this regard, although, again, there is still a huge cavern that needs to be filled um, going forward if we're really serious about making our homes more sustainable uh, in the long run. Um, and again, something Frank touched on briefly, but I'll mention again is, so the Green Deal, but who is, who is it really for? Um, our analysis shows that there is a huge risk of 
um, a dichotomy or a cabin opening up between um, different types of household, between tenants um, and homeowners and different types of tenants and different income groups in terms of who can actually take advantage of various public funding schemes for renovations and so on. So there is a risk that we will have people who are left behind um, with the EU Green Deal and the ambition to make our homes more environmentally sustainable. Uh, in that regard, I'm often reminded of this recent quote by uh, Franz Timmermans, the executive, uh, European Commission Executive Vice President for the Green Deal. He said, fairness is key. Our ambition, ambition should help not hurt the most vulnerable in society. The transition will be just or there will be no transition. So that is the ambition. That is the um, signal that the European Commission has sent out on this issue. The question is whether or not the policy is being put forward by the EU and by national governments uh, are credible in that regard. So one of the issues, because I realize I'm running out of time, one of the issues is uh, been announced nice recently is to extend the European uh, Emissions Trading Scheme, the ETS, to, um, the, to the building sector, to the built environment. Um, it is expected that um, that will increase energy costs uh, for ordinary homeowners, which will particularly impact those who are already experiencing energy poverty or live in uh, kind of low income situations. In order to counteract that, uh, that inevitability, the European Union proposes the Social Climate Fund, the SCF, uh, which will disperse about 72.2 billion uh, in funding to help low income households and others to transition to a more environmentally sustainable uh, future. And that is over the period of 2025 to 2032. So again, if you think about the 115 billion per annum figure we talked about, that 72.2 billion over a seven year period really is a drop in the ocean. Um, from the point of view of Housing Europe, uh, members we've committed to renovating an additional 4 million homes by 2030. However, uh, if we want those homes to be upgraded to an A or B energy rating, uh, we estimate that the uh, additional funding required to do that will be about 13 billion euro uh, a year, over and above the 23 billion euro a year that the sector is already spending on renovation of homes for primarily low income people. And to conclude, today's event actually falls quite well for us because Housing Europe is about to uh, announce or release uh, our own kind of view on the Fit for 55 package, which I'm sure you're, you're aware of. And this is the uh, statement on what we think about the Social Climate Fund. So just to pick out the, the first line, uh, the Social Climate Fund will not be sufficient to compensate for the increase in the cost of energy expected from the introduction of the ETS for buildings and transport. So effectively, we remain to be convinced and indeed our current view is that the EU has great ambition in terms of uh, making our homes more sustainable, making our economy more sustainable, but the actual tools they're putting in place to, to achieve that and to make sure that we, to go back to Franz Schirmer's quote, that we do have a just transition, we're, we're not there today. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to discuss the, this topic and the, the, all the presentation were really fascinating until now. Uh, so I've learned a lot myself. Um, so yeah, my name is Stan Jordan. I'm the executive director of Positive Money Europe. Uh, just so for those who don't know us, we're, we're an NGO based in Brussels and we basically do campaigns, research and, and, and uh, advocacy work around uh, all issues around the European Central Bank, really. And our goal is basically to make the, the European Central Bank uh, contribute to more fair and sustainable and, and democratic economy. Uh, so as part of that, uh, housing is a key aspect for us that we, we want to address more in the future in the sense that um, the, the, and you know, the, the key part of my talk would be to, to try to, to convince you that the European Central Bank is, is basically playing a problematic role uh, uh, currently in terms of allowing people to access affordable housing. And I'm going to explain that a bit more. So the first thing to say, and I think this morning, Sharon Donnelly from, from, from the Central Bank of Ireland has touched upon this, but I think I would have hoped that she has uh, displays this chart on the, on the left hand side, which is uh, a chart that I borrowed from the ECB, which shows the connection between the issuance of loans and obviously mostly for, for mortgages or loans for house purchase and the house price as such. I think this is quite straightforward and obvious for many people, but I'm still baffled by it. this is not that the, this is this fact is not provided out, out loud like, like I'm doing now. This says that the correlation is pretty straightforward. It's demonstrated by research on the left-hand side, it's research by ECB. On the right-hand side, it's research by uh, 
Joshua and Collins and others who have, who have built the database over two centuries, over more countries than Europe. And we always see this pattern that basically the more bank issue loans for, for house purchase, the more houses pricing go up. Um, and why is that? I mean, again, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's a demand and supply dynamic. This has been mentioned several times, but I've, I think this morning so far, many people have emphasized the lack of supply of housing. And it's certainly true there are problems there. I'm not going to deny that. But I think I would like to focus your attention a bit more on the, on the, on the demand side. So this demand for housing is driven by you know, population growth and so on. But I think the, the demand is also driven by where the people can access uh, loans uh, for buying a house. Uh, and the, a key feature of the banking system is that the, the banking sector on aggregate has technically an unlimited capacity to offer loans for, 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 for people and for companies. Of course, there are limits to that. Uh, Sharon Donaris this morning said, you know, there are macroprudential rules. You know, if you're not basically, if you're too risky as a, as a, as a household, you know, you won't get a loan from the bank, but, but it's not like there's a shortage of funds for banks to lend money to people. It's more like the only, the only constraint for banks to offer loans is basically how many customers they have that want to, 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 to get a loan. But, and, and of course, then the interest rate will be different depending on risk profiles and depending on the interest rate by DCD. But the, the key point here is that there's complete elasticity of demand for, 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 for housing purchase through loan issuance. And of course, in front of that, uh, we have a shortage of supplies on housing for very strong reason. First, this, <laughs> and this is also an obvious point that no one ever says, but this land scarcity. Every country has limitation. Uh, especially when we have a urbanization uh, pattern that uh, more and more people live in, in concentrated areas. So we end up having shortage of land, simple, simple as that. There's obviously limited uh, in investment over the past decades that's you know, neoliberalism on steroids have, have been causing this. And, and even if we had strong willingness, you know, strong public willingness to invest into housing production, you know, in constructing new homes, there will always be a delay in terms of you know, building a home takes time basically. And, and you, you always have a, a, a tension between um, demand for, for bank loans going faster than basically the production of, of housing. So that's why I, I strongly believe we have housing price inflation going on on a structural basis by, 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 by definition from the system. I would like to draw your attention on the second chart, which I'm sorry, is, I just borrowed it from a French report. It's not completely translated, but I think you'll get the idea pretty, pretty clear. So it's the number of dwellings owned by people, uh, depending on their wealth level. So the more you go on the right-hand side of this chart, the more people are rich and the more they possess homes. It's also a very straightforward point. I think many people, it's instinctive, right? But, but it's good to have figures on this because what you show here, what you see here is that basically the more rich you are, the more housing you, you own. And I would like to make you think about the connection between this chart and the chart I see, and the, the, the things I said before. Why is it possible that pe rich people get more homes? Uh, isn't there a link there about the fact that rich people can have more easy access to bank loans? And therefore, it's more easy for them to accumulate properties um, and then to rent them out. Uh, so I think this is why I think the, bank sec the banking sector and the ECB that's sitting on top of it play a key role in basically making it easier for rich people who already have um, real assets or, or any types of wealth it's easier for them to accumulate housing and therefore to prevent others from accessing home ownership. Um, so the, the ECB and the central bank, the, the commercial bank system is facilitating uh, accumulation of wealth for some and this population of wealth for others. Um, so once I've said that, so the role of the central bank in particular is very problematic. I think I've already said that, but just maybe to, to recap at this point, and also to bring another point that I've not mentioned yet, because it's been a big debate in the last uh, few months, the way the ECB measures inflation uh, through the HICP index that's produced by Eurostat, the EU statistical agencies, structurally underestimates the cost of housing price. If you look at the, in, the HICP index, um, the, the, they estimate that the cost of housing for people is 6.5%. Uh, obviously, I think we're all paying a rent or some form of mortgage payment are higher than 6% of our uh, monthly budget. We all know this. And you know, I won't go into the details of why this is the case. It's, it's partly because 
history, you know, they're not, not similar data in all countries. So, you know, it's not the ECB's fault that this is the case, but currently the inflation index that the ECB is looking at for accomplishing its monetary policy mandate is not incorporating uh, enough the, the, the cost of housing. And therefore, the, if the housing price inflation that the ECB is generating by providing low, low, low interest rate and by supporting banks' money creation, the ECB does not compute the effect of its policies when it looks into the, its own inflation uh, index. That's, that is the main, uh, you know, the inflation index is really the main way that the ECB's, is, the ECB's performance is evaluated. The ECB's mandate is, is to provide 2% inflation. Uh, and, but again, this, this does not include, include housing costs. Okay, so he, even another point is that, he, and I'm going to go in details here, but in public speeches, I remember Mario Draghi saying this so many times and also central bank governors, they are in, the, in denial mode about this. Um, most often we, we've heard uh, the ECB president say, oh, we do not see a, a housing bubble. We do see tensions in, in, in certain cities, um, but even if there was a generalized problem, this would be a role for macroprudential policy to, to, to mitigate that problem. And it's not a problem of monetary policy. And I think I, I deeply disagree on this. Uh, as I said before, the, the housing price bubble is, is a structural and systemic issue that the ECB generates. So it, it's not the case that you can say, oh, it's only the problem in a few cities. Uh, it, it's much bigger than that. And finally, and we've seen that in the last you know, five years and more, the new policies of the ECB, so-called unconventional policies, uh, quantitative easing, asset purchases, negative interest rate, I've just exacerbated this problem even more. Um, so just one way to think about this is when you have you know, nearly 0% or 0 uh, interest rate on, 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 on the ECB uh, policy, that means people, right now, if, you, if you're in a good situation, you can borrow money maybe at 1% at, at your bank. But of course, you need to have enough capital to do that. You need to have a certain income level. You need to have a stable jobs, depending on, on macro potential regulation. So basically, not everyone is able to, to take advantage of low interest rate right now. Uh, and that's a key problem that no, no one is really, I think, uh, mentioning. OK, so just moving on. So a key decision that the ECB made recently was to tackle the, 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 the inflation measurement problem that I mentioned. So they, they decided to include the unoccupied housing costs into the HRCP. I'm not going to go into the statistical <laughs> discussion on this now, but basically they try; they are trying to do something. Uh, but when you look at what will likely be the effect of these changes uh, in the in the way they measure inflation, you, you can see this chart is again a chart from DCB itself. And basically, what you see is that if if you do what DCB um, uh, say they will do, the changes in the inflation level will be almost known. So the difference is is really trivial here. You see the the, the lines are almost uh, touching each other. So basically what DCB has decided to do is a lot of noise for little change in, in, in how DCB will think about this issue, I think. So we have to tackle that. So in, in a nutshell, what we think we, the right approach should be uh, is that basically we need to talk about credit guidance policies. What, what do we mean by that? We mean by that that the ECB and other regulators, not just the ECB in, in that occasion, but we need to think about where credit goes, where does bank lending goes, who can access to bank credit, on what terms. And basically, I think we need to reverse the logic like that the more you're rich, the more banks can lend to you. It should almost be the opposite that if you are on low income, you should have privileged access to, 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 to loans, at least for accessing home ownership. Uh, so there should be uh, an advantage for, uh, there should be incentives for, for, for banks to, to help people uh, access housing. And on the opposite, it, it should be discouraged to, to leverage on bank lending in order to accumulate uh, and speculate on, on real estate. So that's one thing. The second thing is when DCB needs to stimulate the economy, currently they, 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 do, they use one size fits all policies such as interest rate and quantitative easing. Those are very blunt policies. Another alternative to, for that would be to use uh, what, what economists call helicopter money, which is a form of social dividend, you could say, where we would give checks to individuals, to households to stimulate the economy instead of creating policies that uh, just exacerbate um, housing price inflation. And finally, it's time to talk about fiscal and monetary coordination and to give more room for, for public investment to also uh, uh, support uh, the, the problem of the, the lack of supply of housing that we, we also mentioned this morning. There are other policies I won't detail here, but of course we also endorse what other speakers have said before. There should be more encouragement for member states to, to uh, 
to um, to you know to invest in public housing, better standards to protect people against evictions and 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 repossession. That uh, I'm aware this has been a big issue in Ireland and in Spain as well. There's a very lack of EU legislation on that field to protect people against eviction. Um, just the last one to say, this, this slides I've been showing, we just published a blog by my colleague Mark Beckman this morning. It's on our website. I will put the link as well, but there's more details to, to what I've just said. And I, I wanted to thank my colleague as well for, for helping me prepare this talk. Thank you very much. I look forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Stan. That's a really remarkable insight here and some really valuable proposals for the next 10 years uh, for, the, for the European Central Bank. Uh, I should say we're publishing a report on all these presentations. Uh, we'll be publishing the slides and we'll be publishing a detailed report where every presenter has written um, a summary of their, of, their paper, of their presentation. And so our next speaker is Rory Hearn, uh, whose book Housing Shock, uh, of course, is a bestseller, uh, as you know, Rory. Um, so I'll go straight over. The floor is yours. OK. So... In terms of my presentation, there's some crossover with uh, what has been presented already, so I won't uh, repeat what has been done. But I suppose to give a bit of a, a perspective from, from Ireland, a member state, um, the crisis um, in terms of housing has many facets <clears throat> and aspects to it in Ireland. Um, one of the most pernicious ones, and of course is the most egregious uh, violation of the right to housing, is homelessness. And in particular, um, we're seeing both, uh, we have seen over the last um, six, seven years is an unprecedented rise in homelessness of both individuals and in particular, the new emergence of what's called family and child homelessness. Um, and you can see from these uh, graphs, these are figures of Dublin in terms of presentation of um, both presentation, this is on the left-hand side, we see here, this is the numbers of families who are becoming homeless. This is 2014, this is uh, 2016, 2018, and 2020. And what we see here, a dramatic rise from 2014 onwards in the number of families who are presenting as homeless. Um, and we saw that rise really up till the pandemic. And then what was really fascinating was, of course, this effective collapse, a uh, real fall in the presentation of families who were homeless um, during the pandemic. And of course, that was because in large part due to the policy measure, which introduced a ban on evictions um, over the period of the pandemic was reintroduced later on when we had restrictions on uh, mobility during various lockdowns. Um, and when that ban was removed then earlier this year, what we've seen since is the reemergence um, of families presenting at a large scale, uh, on a larger scale, similar to pre-pandemic levels um, in terms of being homeless. And in large part, they are coming from the private rental sector, um, evictions, um, landlords selling their properties. So we see we have this major crisis ongoing and re-emerging in a, well, we're still within a pandemic context. Um, and similarly, we see that, you know, between 2014 and 2018, there was a 300% increase in family and child homelessness. And we know when increasingly research is highlighting the detrimental um, impact and potentially long term impact of homelessness on children. And um, it is a, a ACE and adverse childhood experience, which can have uh, psychological implications, can have developmental Im implications particularly extended periods of time in emergency accommodation. Um, and again, we see this fall, very dramatic fall in uh, family homelessness in emergency accommodation over the period of the pandemic, but starting to rise again um, in the current context. That's just a bit about the, the homelessness aspect. We also have other aspects of the crisis in Ireland. It's much broader. We have issues of the rents that uh, Dara Turnbull talked about. Um, explained very high rents, significant increase in recent years, and um, the fall in home ownership rates. And we also have a high rate of young adults who are living at home with their parents. Um, and while we are close to uh, just above the European Union average, we're at 54% of young adults between 18 and 34, we are double um, what the rate is in Sweden. And I suppose what this shows is that there are, of course, there are different cultural um, uh, aspects to young people, young adults, and not so young adults living at home in the family home, but it's certainly not traditional 
in Ireland for young adults to live at home with their parents for extended periods. Periods Traditionally, young adults moved out in their early 20s um, and got their own home. So this is a substantial uh, cultural shift in Ireland, but it's not a cultural shift driven by choice, but one driven by the in in inadequate supply of affordable housing. So the question of what's the EU doing well then? There is absolutely, and this has been pointed out, so I won't repeat it, the EU Green New Deal, recognizing the need for the EU to lead an in investment in climate resilience through public infrastructure investment, very, very important principle. Um, also the, um, the ECB supporting the debt situation of EU member states, enabling member states to borrow um, on interest rates and enabling this to remain very low, this is vital to supporting member states invest, continue to invest in social and affordable housing. In particular, also the stimulus response to COVID, in contrast with the response to the economic crash of 2008 and 2009, where austerity was enforced as the response. In this time, uh, we have learned, and apparently the EU as well, also um, has learned from the failed austerity policies, and we've seen stimulus as a response, which is absolutely essential that that continues um, and in particular, I suppose, around the fiscal rules is quite important on that, and there's decisions coming up on that in the coming months. The European Pillar of Social Rights is also a really excellent initiative, um, which puts affordable, secure, quality homes, the right to housing, central to policy and vision for the EU. So what does the EU need then to improve the situation? There is the need still, I think, to revise economic and housing, housing model use, models used in EU policymaking away from what would broadly be called a neoliberal um, boom bust cycles from the you know, view of housing as an asset, as an investment, the dominance of the market as the key area to provide housing, um, and instead to move towards more a broadly what might be called social democratic approach to housing, housing as social market rather than free market, but in particular one that recognize, recognizes the fundamental role of housing to health, to education, to climate, to the well-being of EU citizens, and therefore cannot be left to the vagaries and inequalities of the market, and to recognize the market is changing in housing. The increased role of global uh, equity funds, real estate funds in housing globally means that the market is no longer the market of the 1980s or 1990s or even early 2000s, whereby it was between homeowners, uh, maybe wealthy people buying homes, that there is a new player in the housing market that really radically changes how we have to view it. There is a competitor for housing now, which is the real estate equity funds who want to convert housing into a commodity um, that essentially is another commodity of theirs that they extract as much profit from. And this is a real challenge. We're seeing it in Ireland as a real challenge. And I think it's a real challenge across the EU. Um, the question then is in terms of you know, what the EU needs to do, it needs to, I think in particular, support the not-for-profit housing sectors to deliver um, and the state to become key guarantors um, and deliverers um, of housing. And in terms of that, I think there needs to be a reassessment of state aid rules for social housing, which would enable member states to invest on a much broader level in public and not-for-profit provision of social housing for not just low-income earners, um, but also for middle-income earners in housing need as well. I think that's very fundamental. Um, essentially trying to expand out the um, more the, the Vienna model of housing to become a key vision for Europe in its different forms as it would take, but essentially that concept that social housing support should not be something just for low income earners, but member states should be encouraged and enabled to invest in social housing for middle income earners also. And I think this is particularly important in the context of young emerging generation rent households, generation as referred to who are at home um, for a long time in their, uh, and unable to move out of their, their parents' homes. And the impacts of course of that on the economy um, in terms of restricting uh, people's independence, their ability to take up employment. And um, so there are real economic impacts on that. I think there is a need to extend, of course, uh, beyond March of next year, the uh, suspension of the fiscal rules to enable member states to continue to borrow for investment in building social and affordable housing. Social and, and affordable housing 
is one of the key areas that can really address the climate um, area, the issue of climate mitigation, of reduction of energy consumption within homes. Um, but there's a real problem that if it is left to the market to largely deliver, that there will be a huge inequality in that adjustment. And if the EU wants to achieve and member states want to achieve a climate adjustment, which is uh, societies are engaged in on a cohesive basis, where everybody is buying in, then I really think it needs to deliver affordable um, energy efficient homes, particularly for low and middle income earners as a key dividend within the transition to a zero carbon, low carbon um, societies. As I mentioned earlier, also there needs to be better regulation of financialization, particularly the predatory real estate financial actors who are playing an increasing role um, in the residential sectors, sectors in locking out affordable, the possibilities of affordable housing, purchasing land, pushing up um, rents and house prices. And also we need more EU support for cooperative housing and community land trusts as a key to green housing delivery, building green homes and community. So my ideal Europe then to finish up, I hope I haven't gone too much over time, uh, in 10 to 20 years is that the human right to housing is a guiding principle for housing and economic and social policy also um, in the EU and where everybody has access to affordable, secure, sustainable homes. Just to thank NUI Galway and in particular, uh, a great friend, Pari Kenna for the invite today uh, and the European Movement Ireland. Um, I think without further ado, we're going to get into the presentations and then we'll have some uh, space for questions at the end. So please use the Q&A box there uh, to send us in some questions. So first of all, over to Barbara Steenbergen from the Brussels Office of the International Union of Tenants. You're very welcome, Barbara. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, greetings to the audience, greetings from Brussels. Um, I'm very happy that you are all still here because it has been already a long and interesting morning and now it's the last panel and uh, let's see what we can have as an added value for you as an additional information you haven't heard before. Uh, many important things have been said. Um, I would like to come uh, back to our point of view, the point of view of the tenants unions. Um, first of all, uh, shortly introducing uh, the International Union of Tenants. Um, we are extremely old. Uh, we are established in 1926, and uh, actually, um, we are um, not only a tenants union, but we also represent what we call the poor owners in uh, the post-communist uh, uh, countries. Those uh, people were able uh, to buy uh, their apartments, their uh, houses, but they are in a very bad shape. So uh, in the Eastern countries, we represent even the owners, but we are the International Union of Tenants. And um, our goal is it to have a fair housing policy uh, for those uh, who want to be a tenant. Actually, uh, it is also a choice to be a tenant. Uh, we have heard before that many people think that home ownership is the best you can uh, do in your housing career. Well, as, uh, as a person coming from Berlin, I would not say that, actually. Um, as you all know, perhaps uh, Berlin is the city is, uh, is a city with the uh, highest percentage of uh, tenants all over the world. We have um, currently 86%, and um, nobody of, of the Berliners would even say, why should we become homeowners? Because we don't want to be a slave of the banks. So um, it's, it's another uh, point of view that, uh, that we have. And um, let me tell you a little bit about um, tenants representation, why it is important that we organize, and also what we think uh, would be an ideal world uh, for um, a fairer housing market from the point of view of the tenants. Um, so first of all, I think it is very important um, to know that um, the tenants movement is a very old movement and part of the social movement. We have been founded um, um, in some countries um, uh, together with the trade unions. So um, it is a very old tradition that you become a member of a tenant union when you want to improve your housing conditions. This is not in every country of the world uh, like this, but it's mainly in the European countries. But in those countries, we also have very strong tenants unions. Um, and tenants unions play an incredible role when it comes to the definition of housing policies, uh, on the definition of strategies, on a definition about the rent law. 
and the tenancy law. And I think this is very important to know, especially uh, for you, dear colleagues here in Ireland, because actually Ireland is a little bit a blind spot on our map. Um, there are not strong tenants union in Ireland. You are not so well organized. And um, one of my missions for today is to encourage you, organize yourself, um, establish tenants union, and um, try to play a, a very important role um, when it comes to the negotiation of your rental contract, when it comes to the negotiation of rent control, of rent stabilization mechanisms, when it comes to the negotiation of more public, social and affordable housing. This is um, very crucial for us um, to tell you there in Ireland, it is important to organize and it's important um, to have a counterbalance um, with regard to the landlords. And we do not see that uh, so far in Ireland as it should be. Um, this is one point I think uh, important to make. Um, what I want to emphasize, because we are talking here about the European policies, level policies at, uh, uh, for European housing policymakers, what have we been doing good so far? Well, I think there are two interesting things that happened uh, in the last years. First of all, uh, we managed to have, uh, I think, one of the most hands-on action plans when it comes to the provision of affordable housing at EU level, uh, which was published by the EU Partnership for uh, Affordable Housing. And the coordinator is uh, amongst us, Michaela Kauer. Uh, she was one of the speakers in the panel this morning representing the historically, I think, best housing policy we have, uh, city of Vienna, but still the best housing policy you can get because Vienna always said, we will never abandon our public and social housing stock. The opposite is true. Our goal is to remain, to stay the biggest landlord that we are. So the city of Vienna owns 220,000 social housings. And I think this is very, very important to know. When do you want to, when you want to play a significant role on, on the housing markets? I think it is important to have strong public and social housing providers owned by the city, owned by the state, owned by the regions. So this is um, extremely important. What we also did well at the European level lately was um, the uh, initiative report uh, on affordable housing for all. Also, uh, uh, one of the speakers uh, already said a little bit uh, about that. Kim Sparentag was the rapporteur on this um, report, but this was really a game changer at European level. We are working at European level, uh, many of you here on this panel since many, many years, but the Kim von Sparentag report changed a lot because um, it opened doors uh, for us, for the housing policy people that have been closed before. I'm gonna give you some small examples about that. What is in this report for the tenants? Talking about our point of view. First of all, crucial issue, um, how to describe the fairest housing markets for tenants? Well, a fair housing market for tenant is the housing market where a long-term rental contract, an unlimited rental contract is the norm and not the exemption. And this is, uh, I think, something uh, very important to know, to have a long-term unlimited rental contract. This is um, the main category to uh, ensure security of tenure. This is important. Um, Another point in this um, report at European level, how can you change your housing market to the better? Well, by rent price stabilization and rent control. Um, when I was um, checking a, a little bit the Irish housing market, what happened lately, we can see that your rents are skyrocketing high. You have a massive um, problem with the supply of affordable rental housing. You have a lot of luxurious rental housing with rent prices around the 2000 euros. But this is not uh, the classical uh, rental market where people, the normal people, the key workers uh, in the cities do have access to. 
Um, and uh, what we have also heard from Ireland that everything um, what is now um, put on the rental market has an enormous increase in rents. So the average increase in rents is 6.8% from the last year till now. This is inflation. So what do we have to do? What can you do? I think very clearly, there has to be a very clear rent control and rent stabilization mechanism. And this can be only implemented by the government because the, the market will not solve your problem like that. And obviously there is also a problem with supply in Ireland because minute, there Barbara. is too much supply for let's say the luxurious sector and too less supply for the affordable housing sector. So, um, but perhaps we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, what is also extremely important is um, um, that we have more policies which go into the direction of tenure neutrality. And tenure neutrality means, it's a technical term, that um, home ownership, rental housing, and cooperative housing are treated in the same way. So financially, um, so we have a clear bias towards home ownership in every country of the world. Uh, to overcome that, it's not easy, but I think it is necessary because we know that only promoting home ownership will lead people into even more poverty because less and less people can afford to become homeowner. And we know this from the crisis uh, in America. Um, remember, uh, uh, there it all started huh? for people uh, forcing, forcing people into home ownership who could not afford that. Um, one of my last points, uh, perhaps interesting um, to know with regard to the EU Green Deal. Um, the EU Green Deal will be, I think, the most challenging thing that the EU has done so far when it comes to the renovation of houses. Yes, they have big plans. Um, they want to go into a carbon uh, neutral uh, housing market. Well, I wish you a lot of luck with that. Problem is still, if you do a regeneration, if, if you do a renovation of the houses, in the majority of the European member states, all these investments of the landlords can directly be passed on to the tenants, which means that the tenants pay for the renovation. How can you then guarantee that the tenants after renovation can still stay in their houses? I think this is the challenge. And Nobody has ever given an answer to that. We know that the Green Deal is completely underfinanced. Uh, we heard it already from our colleagues from Housing Europe. Um, and there is no mechanism that protects the tenants. Um, there is a technical term for this. It's called renovations, evictions by renovation. And this is a threat that most of the European tenants will face in the near future because there is no net for them. The only way how we can get out of this that the EU Green Deal will become a massive threat for the tenants and the inhabitants of cities where there are massive renovations. It's the principle of housing cost neutrality. This principle means that the increases in rent are fully balanced by energy savings. And this principle can be implemented in the European Green Deal but as far as I see, um, ladies and gentlemen, this has not been done so far and the lobby is too weak uh, to do this. So thank you, Barbara. I'm going to move on to Nuria, um, who is from the wonderful city of Tarragona in Spain, one of my favorite places. Um, over to you, Nuria. Uh, starts by delimiting the main concepts that guide the research, uh, which are sometimes unclear or not easy to define. For example, we have housing affordability, housing sustainability, uh, inclusiveness, um, among other concepts. Then we undertook a country studies in order to achieve a bottom-up approach. And we used to do so, we used objective criteria to choose the best practices and to highlight the lessons learned, pointing out strengths, weaknesses, the replicability of the, of the measures and policies. And finally, the result was extracting lessons learned and formulating multi-level policy recommendations for the EU countries on, on relation to the, to the main housing challenges that, that were addressed. 
Then here uh, you can see the most commonly addressed topics by national reporters, which were, uh, I think most of them have already uh, been raised today. The first one is the impact of the process of urbanization, um, uh, which together with the supply constraint by land scarcity, geographical restrictions, lack of territorial cohesion, lack of social and affordable housing, and also uh, already mentioned processes of gentrification of cities and touristification, this all contributed to housing unaffordability in major urban areas in the EU member states. The second uh, big field that was addressed is social rental housing in two different approaches. First one, the size of its share, if it's too big or too small, and also secondly, its management or mismanagement. And finally, the third big issue uh, mentioned was housing deprivation in terms of lack of adequacy of housing in different fields, uh, need for renovation of the stock, improvement of energy efficiency, and universally accessible housing and independent living, mainly for disabled and aging people. Of course, other issues were highlighted, housing governance in terms of a lack of coherence in housing policies and insufficient data and research in, in related to, to housing, migration, refugees, Roma people, housing insecurity, and last but not least, uh, also uh, defended here today, homelessness and in its different forms, which is, which is a problem on the rise in nearly every, every European country. Then the lessons learned, I'm not going to discuss them in detail because some of them will be raised now when we talk about the, the EU recommendations. So the study concludes, as I said, with a set of multi-level policy recommendations or actionable points, 10 recommendations for the local municipal level, 10 for the regional national level, and 10 for the European Union level. Uh, these ones are the ones for the EU level. And uh, we can gather them, or I have gathered them according to the lessons learned of the study. The first lesson learned would be to tackle the existence of incoherent or even contradictory multi-level housing legislation, and also um, the need to produce reliable data and trustworthy and independent housing research to properly orientate housing policies. And in that lesson learned, we have some recommendations. The First one would be setting up, setting up an integrated strategy for housing within the European Commission, which could take the form of a potentiated inter-service group housing. The, of course, the, there is a cross impact of housing in, if, in many fields as we can see here today. And this coordinated approach could also improve the, the analytical basis of housing assessment and could help uh, the shift for the complexity of national housing systems, not only selected elements, but the whole system, the, the system as a whole. Uh, second recommendation would be in that, uh, in that particular uh, lesson learned, developing a full-fledged database on housing matters. Uh, for example, they, to collect data and monitor of housing deprivation, homelessness, housing exclusion, types of housing tenures, housing investment, energy efficiency, and so on. Also to create a better framework conditions for decent, sustainable, and affordable housing via the European semester process. Uh, this could be accomplished, for example, by revisions of indicators on housing in the social scoreboard or in the macroeconomic imbalances procedures, taking into account, for example, uh, the housing tenures, the continuum of housing tenures and housing cost of a burden. And also another recommendation is the creation of an ad hoc EU observatory and research center on housing to precisely warranty objectives housing, housing research. A second uh, lesson, big lesson learned in the study was to the need, there's a need to increase social and affordable housing stock, uh, especially in new urban areas. And in that sense, uh, some of the recommendations are, first of all, increasing financial resources, mainly through a better and combined use of local, national and European funding and European investment bank financing. Also through, and it has already been mentioned and more than one time, the renovation wave within the European Green Deal, and taking into account um, not only uh, about improving the sustainability and improving energy efficiency, but important to put efforts on to tackling housing deprivation, which is one of another lessons learned to precisely warranty this universal accessibility to housing, uh, the need for housing renovation uh, and housing efficiency and in that sense it would be also interesting to assess the impact and the results of this funding 
also take into account the renovations that precisely Barbara just, just uh, pointed out. Then uh, more recommendations would be to make concrete the right to social housing uh, enacted in the European pillar of social rights and to expand it to a broader um, beneficiaries to uh, affordable housing to, to all those people who cannot uh, find this and affordable and sustainable housing in the, in the free market. Uh, more uh, recommendations in that in that um, lesson learned, considering the expenditure of affordable housing and sustainable housing, a key investment in the revision of the European fiscal rules and revision of the target group of social housing in the service of general economic interest definition. So it could include investment on more affordable and, and sustainable housing solutions. Um, the third lesson learned was already mentioned. The fourth lesson learned, which is to increase literacy in the field of housing among citizens and to transfer and communicate of trustworthy housing research to groups of interest, also adding more proactivity of the public administration and the third sector. And here, we also have some recommendations. We can highlight two of them. For example, one could be, would be to create a solid specialized housing cooperative network, increasing the coordination of the EU with major stakeholders organizations, your city, Council of European Municipalities Regions, DNHR, um, and another recommendation would be to reestablish the network of national focal points on housing policies uh, to ensure the mechanism to ensure uh, the exchange of information and knowledge uh, at the same time scaling, scaling up monitoring on of affordable housing needs and, and policies in the European um, Union member states. And, and finally, another, another lesson learned, among others, is to tackling urbanization externalities, which it has already been mentioned today. So we need further research on the impact on financialization and touristification on housing markets and the common European rule, which has been already mentioned, addressed today. So to conclude, um, the idea is that in, in 10 years, the European has been, it would, uh, the idea would be that it could implement all or most of the highlighted recommendations so that all these full database on housing matters, this research, these integrated strategies at the EU level, the coordination and the networking, the funding and the financing and assessing the impact of its funding, revising some concepts we have mentioned. So all this uh, could provide the EU with the tools to be able to address the multidimensionality and complexity of housing affordability and sustainability through a holistic approach of, on the housing field. And, and also that could acknowledge the diverse housing situations and issues in the EU countries. Uh, not only the countries, regions, but also cities, which are different, but at the same time face similar and new challenges on housing policies as we have, been, we have seen here today. So the final idea uh, that I would like to, uh, to give you is that all these EU level recommendations that we have mentioned, of course, cannot be considered in isolation, but they require a coordinated policy at various levels, local, regional, and also national. I'm going to move on to the next speaker, um, which is Dr. Anya Sparin, Menuai Galway, who's provided us with a pre-recorded um, presentation. Okay, hi everyone, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. My name is Anya Spern. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Disability Law and Policy at NUI Galway. I'm going to speak to you very briefly today about the role of the European Union in advancing disabled people's housing and independent living rights. Firstly, it's really important to recognise the social model of disability which identifies the barriers in society are what disables people rather than um, an individual impairment. And these barriers are very evident in housing systems which disabled people interact with on a daily basis. Historically, housing for disabled people has been provided within institutional or long term residential settings or have been single units kind of built on the outskirts of towns and cities. This out of sight, out of mind approach is proving very difficult to marry with member states' human rights obligations towards disabled people. 
While much of the focus on independent living does relate to the provision of personal assistance for disabled people, um, a systemic change in our attitude towards housing and um, the design, security and sustainability of housing is necessary. And all of these principles are enshrined within the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or the UNCRPD. So speaking of the UNCRPD um, and positive examples for independent living in the EU, um, we do the EU should be commended for its ratification of the UNCRPD in 2011. Article 19 then of the UNCRPD promotes the right to live independently, to have a choice and control over where and with whom you live, and to have access to any assistive devices or personal assistance that you need in order to live independently and to be able to participate on an equal basis with others in your community. So it, it's very easy to see that um, appropriate um, and accessible housing is really at the cornerstone of Article 19. Through ratification of the CRPD, the EU has undertaken to incorporate disability rights, including independent living rights, across its actions and communications to member states. While all of the institutions within the EU have a role to play, the European Structural Investment Funds have a significant mandate by prohibiting further investment in institutional settings and services which are contradictory to the ethos and obligations of Article 19. This will go some way to ensuring that independent living practices are not considered as an afterthought um, when it comes to public services, but rather that they are built in from the start um, and member states have to make them part and parcel of all public actions. Under the European Disability Strategy from 2010 to 2020, numerous directives have been implemented with an eye to independent living realisation across Europe. For example, there have been um, directives on non-discrimination, on the accessibility of technology, um, on governance of public procurement policies and regulating standards of products and materials used in the construction of houses and buildings. The 2021 to 2030 strategy on the rights of persons with disabilities can also build on the progress made so far. And one of um, the, the key principles of the UNCRPD is information sharing across countries and the European Union um, is, a, uh, is a really good example of being able to share information across member states. In terms of areas of improvement, um, there are more than 1 million disabled people under 65 and over 2 million people over the age of 65 who still reside within institutional settings and that's only a rough estimate. Mm -hmm. Funding through the structural funds and other social funds must embed the principles of Article 19 in their conditions and seek proof of adherence to non-institutional style services. This can be supported by the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan to invest in social services which ensure quality for service users. A disability respectful approach must also be adopted in the EU action plan for the social economy. The current disability strategy um, would do well to advance directives to adopt universal design standards for accessibility which have to be enforced in each member state. And this will enable disabled people to move freely for work or leisure which is a key element of the, the European Union and have the same expectation of accessibility across member states. In the future then, um, the social model of disability um, ideally would be recognised by increasing numbers of public service providers and citizens. This will be achieved through the increased visibility of disabled people across all areas of our lives, from education, employment, public service, political representation, arts, culture um, and sports. Thank you Anya for providing us with that video and I know that Anya will actually join us for the panel discussion and um, I suppose a common theme perhaps running through this session is the need for the voice of people who are affected by housing uh, issues whether it's uh, disabled people or tenants to be heard uh, in the European uh, discussion. Um, we now go from Europe uh, to the USA uh, and we're very pleased to have Professor Mark Rorach from the Southern Law School in, US, uh, in the US uh, to address us and obviously tell us what the US can learn from Europe and maybe we can learn something from you too, Mark. 
So I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Cordrick, for uh, inviting me uh, to come. Um, I'm actually going to focus my talk on the one prong, which is what is Europe doing well? Um, I'm not going to be the typical American to try to come in and say what Europe is not doing well or how Europe can improve because uh, in this sector, I don't think that the US has much room to offer uh, guidance. Um, I, you know, I'll start by by observing um, something that that has been made clear throughout the day, which is that housing exists in an ecosystem. Um, whether we're talking about homelessness, uh, as Rory described uh, in the previous session, uh, dealing with uh, the need for expanding social housing, uh, or whether, as Barbara pointed out, the the role of evictions and the role of uh, expanded social housing access in places like Vienna, or as Nuria just pointed out a few minutes ago, um, the role of data collection and the ability to communicate that data uh, in various settings. I wanna focus on one aspect of the housing uh, ecosystem, which is the consumer bargain. Uh, what is the role of contract terms within mortgage relationships um, and how do those shape the way we enter interact with the ecosystem. And, and to do so, one of the things I think that we need to appreciate is we need to appreciate the fact that um, the consumer bargain and the consumer transaction is the most organic uh, interaction of consumers uh, within the housing system. Um, it, is, it is the place where their remedies are shaped uh, in relationship to uh, their lender. Um, it is often the place where uh, the terms and the conditions on which they will interact with housing are defined, whether we're talking the interest rate that they will pay uh, on a mortgage or we're paying the, talking about the amount of money that they are able to, to lend uh, in order to acquire housing. And so the consumer contract um, is a very important space for understanding how do we deal with unfair or unconscionable terms uh, in relationship to mortgage lenders. Um, and so to do so, I want to think about the role that uh, the Aziz case and what Spain uh, has given to the rest of Europe that the rest of the world can learn from. Um, so as, as uh, some of you may be aware or you may not be aware, um, in 2013, the case went through the Spanish court system dealing with an individual who was, whose home was being foreclosed on. And he challenged the terms on unfair uh, that, that the terms of the mortgage were unfair, that they uh, provided um, uh, interest accelerations that were unconscionable, um, and that the terms of the mortgage should not therefore be in, enforced. Now, so one of the things I think that's important to understand is that Aziz represented a moment in Spain's uh, consumer, consumer contract law where the remedies for consumers were really bifurcated. Um, Aziz could not, prior to the European Court of Justice decision, bring a claim for unfair terms in the, Europe, in, in the Spanish court and at the same time challenge the foreclosure. Those things had to happen in separate proceedings. And one of the things the European Court of Justice found is that uh, court has to be able to, under the uh, unfair terms directive, be able to provide interim relief, has to be able to set aside the mortgage or set aside the foreclosure in the process of deciding whether these terms were unfair. Well, that is exactly the place where American consumer law finds itself. Um, it finds itself in a place where rem consumer remedies are bifurcated. Um, and they're bifurcated across scales, they're bifurcated across uh, different um, avenues of private versus regulatory relief. And so I want to focus on just what the U.S. has done and some of the challenges that we face in the hopes that you will not follow us down uh, this trajectory. Um, so in summary, uh, it's my view that Europe is providing a guiding light that we should all think about. Um, it's, it's focus and its ability to extend equivalency and effectiveness uh, across the union is something that the U.S. can learn from. The current bifurcated status of U.S. consumer law between the regulatory and consumer common law contracts that aren't necessarily aligned and don't necessarily um, uh, inform one another uh, mean that the barriers for consumers to enforce their 
uh, rights or claims within unfair bargains uh, is even higher and more uh, more difficult to enforce. Uh, thank you. Um, there were, um, both um, Nuria and Barbara brought up the issue of rent evictions, and I'm just wondering how do you propose to tackle that issue of preventing rent evictions in Europe? Who wants to start? Yes. Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We, we have some clear proposals. Huh? Um, first of all, um, when you check the rent law in uh, several member states in Europe, um, there are very good examples how to prevent rent evictions. And take a look uh, at the Netherlands. For instance, in the Netherlands, 70% of the inhabitants of the buildings have to say yes to the renovation. And if this majority is not reached, the renovation will not take place, which means that you have to make this renovation also a business case for the tenants. And I think this is uh, very important. Um, in Denmark, a very interesting country when it comes to housing policy too. Um, in Denmark, the big housing uh, companies, the supervisory board are tenants. So, if a housing company says, okay, we want to renovate our uh, stock, then the board says, okay, you can do it, but it has to be in favor of the inhabitants of the tenants. This is, I think, quite interesting. Um, from a technical point of view, um, we are very much in favor for the so-called housing cost neutrality when it comes to renovations, which means that um, the increase in rent and that you have in all rent laws, if you renovate, you can pass on the cost to the tenants. Some social housing providers are not doing it, but in the private market, it is a fact that we have to see. And <laughs> this is the reality for most of the tenants. And in the private rental sector, also most of the tenants are evicted after renovations. Mm -hmm. So um, the housing cost neutrality principle means that the increase in rent, in the basic rent, must be fully balanced by energy savings which means that after the renovation, you have the same costs. Uh, this is uh, interesting because it prevents effectively uh, renovations. And it is also very good for the climate because in that case, the renovations are made in a very energy efficient and climate friendly way. So um, these are concrete solutions that we offer and tenants unions have a lot of knowledge about rent law and we can offer you even more if you like to. We are there uh, and happy to ask, answer your questions. Fascinating, Barbara. So tenants having a say on whether renovations happen and how they happen and also cost neutrality. Mark, do you have anything to say on this? Yeah, so this is, this is actually an issue that's come up in US public housing um, uh, significantly where, um, you have U.S. How, U.S. public housing that's reached a point of being um, uh, reaching its the end of its life uh, because it was poorly constructed in the '40s, and so cities seeking to um, to get permission to demolish. And so one of the things that a couple of things that have happened. One thing that's happened is back in the 1980s there was a period where cities were allowing properties to fall into um, uh, disrepair uh, because the federal requirement or threshold for to enable the city to uh, do something different with the property required that the units fall under a certain number of utilization. So they would allow, they, they would allow this kind of constructive demolition of the pro project to just um, uh, devolve. And then the second thing that has happened, or the second second relationship that 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 has created, has been this: um, what do you, what happens with the tenants um, when uh, when that demolition when this uh, when the property is slated for um, that public renovation, and by and large, um, the the tenants have um, have the the attempt has been made to negotiate with the tenants to leave the property willingly uh, in exchange for subsidies. But just recently in my, in my hometown of Savannah, Georgia, uh, there has been, uh, there is a property slated for renovation um, and they delivered eviction notices to uh, 40 tenants um, to vacate the property uh, prior to January 1st uh, so that the, um, so that the property can, 
can undergo renovation. And, um, and so, you know, by and large, the, the tool that states continue to deploy in that uh, mechanism is the traditional eviction remedy. Um, uh, even take in and courts seem to be willing to to participate in that that endeavor. Okay, so maybe there's a few ideas there from Barbara that need to be trans, uh, transferred across the water. Berlin used to be a shining light. What's going on? You know that um, there are currently two cities in Europe where you have to take a closer look if you are a housing expert. These are Barcelona and Berlin. Uh, many interesting things are going on there. Um, I think uh, in both cities, uh, we have a lot of progress when it comes to rent freezes, um, because we heard a lot about today about financialization of housing and concentration on housing markets. And when I take a look uh, to Mark, uh, if I uh, just mentioned BlackRock or Blackstone, we know what we are all talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but also this concentration on the housing market is also a European problem. Uh, so we have to, in a way, also check something, uh, how we can stabilize housing market. And that can be done by rent freezes and rent controls, which makes it not so attractive anymore for those profit-oriented investors to enter these markets or to take over these housing markets. Mm -hmm. We know that um, the takeover of housing market is a fact. Uh, we call it concrete gold. Um, Everybody is entering now, all the money uh, in the world is entering into housing markets and we have to protect what we achieved here at European level. We achieved social housing markets, affordable housing markets, public housing markets. And for us, um, perhaps also something interesting, quite far away uh, when, you, when you take a look at, at the United States, um, in our countries, everybody lives at a certain point of his life in social and affordable housing. As a student, of course, you go to student housing. Uh, then as a young starter at the housing market, as a young family, you go to subsidized housing, to affordable housing. And when you're older or even disabled, you come to a housing institution which helps you to face these changes in your life. So this is very normal for us. And we do not want to lose this tradition. Uh, and we do not want to lose that what we have been fighting for for so many years because all these big investors are coming now to the market and um, trying to yeah, eat up uh, what we built up uh, by public and taxpayers' money. Um, sorry to be so blunt. And I think in those two cities, um, Berlin and Barcelona, and I worked in Berlin for more than 20 years as a tenant activist, I think um, we will manage to balance this housing market, which has been completely out of control because of this massive investment. We will balance, balance it again, and it's done really bottom up from the Thanks, people, Barbara. from the activists. Tenants are certainly making their voice heard in Berlin, that's for sure. So uh, thank you, Barbara. That's a great point to end on. Um, I'd just like to thank Mark, Nuria, Anya, and Barbara for a wonderful session. I'm, I'm now handing over uh, to Martin and Professor Howells to finish the event. Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you indeed to all the speakers and indeed to you, Bob, for chairing the panel so well. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So indeed, to conclude uh, this afternoon's proceedings, to bring the conference to an end, I'm going to pass across now uh, for some closing remarks to my colleague, uh, Professor Garrett Howells, who's Dean of the College of Business, Public Policy and Law here at NUI Galway. Garrett, across to you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, and to everybody. Uh, it really falls to me to thank the speakers and moderators, and of course, our sponsors, the European Movement Ireland and the Housing Agency. And it's been a, a wonderful event. I've been pleased to join for least parts of it. Um, I think special thanks also to go to Poi Kenner, who's been the driving force behind this project of housing and social policy here at NUI Galway for several years, which is one of many activities of, of the centre here. So I really want to thank everybody for putting together what's been a very important conference. And I think um, my background is actually as a consumer lawyer. When I was listening to the papers, I actually felt a great resonance with many of the conferences I've attended as a consumer lawyer because you felt that the people were analytical, but also passionate about trying to achieve greater social justice. And indeed, there's a bit of a debate in consumer law about where uh, tenants' rights fall. So is it really part of consumer law or is it a specialist area? And I was involved in a very interesting project recently on what we call lifetime contracts, which we took, including consumer credit, 
and employment contracts and tenancy contracts. And although we had some tenancy lawyers in that, they weren't enough. And so we actually uh, hope to reach out to you, I think, to, to embrace um, more work with the crossover between consumer and tenancy law. Indeed, um, part of my substantive contribution was actually said already by Mark when he was talking about the Aziz case and the way in which uh, consumer law came along sort of like a jack-in-the-box to help out um, the problems of the over-indebted um, Spanish consumers. You've also seen that happen in Eastern Europe where the problem was about um, people using Swiss currency mortgages and the problems they faced when there was a big um, revaluation of the, of the Swiss franc which made what looked at the time of a attractive financial proposition a, a complete disaster. And the other European court, again, used unfair contract terms law, uh, this time using uh, transparency as a principle to, to, to try to see, achieve social justice in those cases. Thank you for allowing me to attend today. Thank you for allowing me to have a few words to contribute to the discussion. But most of all, uh, thank you all for such a positive, stimulating discussion, which is addressing truly a major social issue for our societies at the moment.